Ouch. The boy on the bus turns around. Did someone pull out one of his hairs? He looks around, but the girl in the seat behind him is staring out the window. She's so quiet and always keeps to herself, he doesn't think it possibly could have been her. The boy turns back around, wondering if he just imagined it, unable to see the small smile forming on the girl's face. The bus stops, and the girl practically sprints off and up the sidewalk to her house. She runs past her mother without saying hello and goes straight into her bedroom, closing and locking the door behind her. She sits at her desk, opens a drawer, and pulls out a small bag. She reaches into the bag and takes out a folded piece of paper. Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker. Do you love someone but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move, their every word. The girl imagines herself watching a tiny version of the boy on the bus right here on her desk, seeing everything that he does, listening to his secret thoughts and desires. If only she knew him better, then she'd have the confidence to talk to him and could get him to like her as much as she liked him. She reaches into the bag and pulls out the naughty stalker. It doesn't look like much, just a little doll made from a woven and twisted length of red string. She looks back to the instructions. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string in our naughty stalker, and see what you've been missing. The girl reaches into her pocket and takes out a single strand of hair. She holds the hair up to the light, looking at it. If this works, it will mean all of her dreams coming true. Just like the instructions said to do, she takes the hair and slides it under a string on the doll's body. She sets the doll down on her desk and waits. And waits. And nothing happens. She picks up the instructions again, turning them over, but there's nothing else except another wonderful product brought to you by blah blah blah. Where were the rest of the instructions on how to get it to work? Why wasn't the doll coming to life? What a piece of junk. What a… wait. What was that? The girl leans in close. Is the doll… breathing? She's startled as the doll turns its head over its shoulder, seemingly looking right at her, or rather, right through her. Coming, mom! The doll shouts before standing up. It starts to walk in place, looking like it is opening invisible doors, and then sitting down on a chair that she can't see. It looks like it's pretending to eat dinner. The girl's eyes widen. The doll is alive. It's really alive. It's actually showing what the boy is doing right now. The naughty stalker has worked. The girl is fascinated by watching the little doll that gives her a peek into her crush's life. She skips her own dinner so she can watch him finish his. She watches as he sits, probably watching TV, takes a shower, and gets ready for bed. It may all just be a little doll acting it out, but it feels like she is there with him. She watches the doll sleep for hours before falling finally asleep herself her head resting on the desk next to him. The next morning, she passes by the boy and his friend sitting together on the bus and goes to the very back. She gets as low in the seat as she can so no one can see her and takes out the doll, holding it up to her ear. She listens to one side of the conversation as the boy talks about the action movie he watched last night, Weapon of Mass Extinction. The boy talks about how much he liked it and how it's his new favorite movie. This was perfect. It's exactly what she needed. The next day in school, as the boy is putting things into his locker, the girl approaches. She pretends to trip and drops her books in front of him, the books scattering on the floor in front of him. The boy helps her pick them up and notices the DVD she dropped, Weapons of Mass Extinction. She explains that she brought her favorite movie to school to loan it to a friend. What a coincidence that they both happen to love the same film. The boy and the girl, bonding over their love of low-budget sci-fi action films, start spending more and more time together. No one has ever understood him the way that she does. It's as if she has known him for years, even though they've only been friends for a few days. Things move quickly though, and before long he realizes that he is having romantic feelings for the girl. This is all the girl had ever wanted, and it's all thanks to the naughty stalker. Things are going so well, in fact, that she imagines she won't even need it much longer. But then, something strange happens. She is sure she heard the boy tell his friend that he loved baseball. But when she brings up the idea of going to a game together, the boy looks at her like she was crazy. He hated baseball. After that, things seem to change. The boy is still so nice when they are together. Now it sounds like he is talking about her behind her back. 
She worries that she has been wrong this whole time, that he has just been messing with her. This stupid doll isn't making her dreams come true, it's making her life a nightmare. But wait, who is the boy talking to? She leans in close to listen. Is he with another girl? Listening to one side of the conversation, she hears the boy tell someone that this is all just a big joke, a prank he is pulling on some dumb girl. Are they? No, they can't be. Kissing? The girl is in a white-hot rage. She can't believe he would do this to her, after she was nothing but perfect to him. She throws the doll across her room. She's going to confront the boy and whoever he's with. She'll teach him a lesson. She'll teach both of them a lesson. It's starting to rain as the girl gets her bike out and starts to ride to where she knows he is, the spot that was supposed to be their own special place. Cars pass close by on the narrow road, splashing her with water, but she doesn't care. She finally reaches the picnic spot where he took her just a few days ago, and she sees a car parked nearby. It must belong to the evil seductress he is with. The girl glares at the car. She grits her teeth until they feel like they might crack. Her fists are clenched so tight that she can't tell if it's the rain or blood from her fingernails digging in that she feels running down her palms. But she doesn't care. She's going to show both of them what happens when you break someone's heart. She takes a step towards the car and… The car that struck her slams on its brakes. The driver gets out and rushes towards her. It's the boy. Her boy. The older couple who are stopped on the side of the road with a flat tire run over to help. The boy gets down next to her and cradles her head in his lap and they have one last moment to look into each other's eyes before the light fades from hers. Unfortunately for all involved, their lives would never be the same. But how could they have known that they were the victims of an encounter with an anomaly that, while small, is extremely dangerous? One that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-693, the Naughty Stalker. SCP-693 are multiple humanoid-shaped dolls, measuring roughly 18 centimeters in length, each made from a single string that is either red, blue, yellow, or black, with onyx beads for eyes. Their clothing will vary in color and style, and seems to have no bearing on the properties of the doll. The string doll will behave exactly as one would expect, showing no anomalous properties at all, until the owner takes the steps that are spelled out in the instructions that always accompany SCP-693. The instruction sheet congratulates the owner on their acquisition of a naughty stalker and explains that in order to use it, a single hair from another person must be inserted into a loop of its string, at which point the doll will attune to that person. The doll will then come alive, mimicking the actions of the hair's owner in real time, including their speech. The doll will perfectly portray the attuned individual for nine days, after which point it will become unreliable. The exact way in which SCP-693 begins changing the speech and actions depends on the color of its base string, but in all cases, its end goal is to drive the current owner of the doll to their death. SCP-693 goes about this by feeding inaccurate information to the owner. Dolls made of red string try to send their owner into increasingly violent fits of rage. Dolls comprised of blue string try to depress the owner and lead them to self-harm. Yellow dolls want to make their owners attempt unwanted acts of physical love, and black dolls encourage their owners to engage in activities and place themselves in situations that are dangerous. Interestingly, SCP-693 will attune not just to the living, but to the deceased as well. When a dead person's hair is placed in a loop of string, the naughty stalker will come to life, just as it does when a living person's is used. But instead of acting out the speech and movements of the person, the attuned doll will claim to be the deceased person and offer to act as a spiritual guide to the owner. But just like with a living person, at the nine-day mark, SCP-693 will become unreliable and will attempt to lead the owner down a path that results in their death. Once an SCP-693 instance is successful in causing its owner's death, a new doll instance will appear and be found on the owner's body. Several of these dolls have been recovered from Naughty Stalker victims, and currently the Foundation has seven red instances, ten blue instances, five yellow instances, and one black instance in its possession. All instances of SCP-693 contained by the Foundation were originally classified as safe and kept in Containment Locker 12C-K, but following the events of Incident 693-E, that classification was revisited. During this incident, a researcher returned a Naughty Stalker doll to its containment locker, but in a lapse of judgment that went against Foundation protocols, they forgot to remove the hair that had been placed in the doll. 
When the locker was next opened, the dolls were observed to have all been moved. They were found in a circle around the accidentally still attuned doll, which had been crucified upside down on the wall of the locker. It is unknown where the dolls acquired nails. After this incident, a camera was placed inside of the locker, and the results were… surprising, to say the least. It turns out that SCP-693 instances come to life when they are not observed, even when they aren't attuned. While they have not yet been observed engaging in violent acts against each other, the camera has captured the naughty stalkers appearing to reenact the final 30 minutes of their last owner's life over and over. Following this new information, all instances of naughty stalker dolls were moved to their own separate 25 by 25 by 25 centimeter steel containers within the containment locker, and their classification was upgraded to Euclid. SCP-693 is one of the rare anomalies where the Foundation actually has quite a good idea as to where it originates, and it was very easy to discover as well. Provided that they aren't a deception, the instructions that appear with each instance of SCP-693 are quite explicit about where they come from. After congratulating the owner on their acquisition and explaining how the doll works, the instructions close by extolling the naughty stalker as yet another wonderful product brought to you by the factory. For those unaware, the factory is a place with a long connection to the Foundation, though the details on that will have to wait for another file exploration. All you need to know now is that the factory produces a huge amount of anomalies, and it appears that SCP-693 is one of them. There are theories that the dolls may have been produced as an espionage tool, but as for why their primary purpose seems to be driving their owner to their death, well that, we simply don't know. What was that? The man and woman's hike through a gently rolling portion of the Rocky Mountains has just taken a turn for the dangerous. There's something there in the bush, the man tells her before stepping in front of her in a defensive pose. They watch the bush intently. There's a slight rustling of the leaves as if something is inside. The man picks up a stick from the ground and holds it in front of him, ready to strike whatever fearsome beast is lurking in the underbrush. The rustling stops, but the man doesn't move from his protective stance. Do you think it's gone? The woman asks. The man isn't sure. He leans in towards the bush, searching for signs of what might be hiding inside when… Ah! The man screams and falls backwards as the creature emerges from the bush. Aww! The woman cries. It's a pika! She kneels down to get a closer look at the adorable little creature. Pikas are native to this part of Colorado, and they resemble rabbits but with small, rounded ears. She watches it hop back off the trail before turning around to see her friend lying tangled in the branches of a tree. She can't help but laugh as she offers a hand to help pull him out of his predicament. Are you alright? She asks between fits of laughter. Yes, he's fine. The only thing hurt was his pride. He notices a small red spot on his arm and rubs it, but it doesn't seem to hurt at all. His attention is diverted by the woman, though, who is marveling at the tree he was just stuck in. Free of the branches, he can appreciate now that the tree really is incredible. It looks like a huge blue spruce, but the name is a complete misnomer, because this tree is a vibrant red color. I've never seen anything like it, she says, and the man hasn't either. Neither knows what species it is, and, strangely, there don't seem to be any others like it. Maybe this is the result of an odd genetic defect that turns blue spruces red. After admiring the tree for a moment, the pair decides that they've hiked far enough and that they should probably head back to the car. She jokes that he's likely exhausted from his run-in with a wild animal and he laughs, but clearly his ego has been bruised. The man stops his car in front of the woman's house and she thanks him for taking her on the hike. As she starts to get out though, he stops her. He asks if she wants to go do something else, like dinner? The woman thanks him for his offer, but she has to be up early the next day for work. Just a quick drink then? An hour? Thirty minutes? The woman tries her best to let her friend down easy, explaining that she likes him as a friend and as only that. The man opens his mouth to respond, but she stops him. If he valued their friendship, then he wouldn't try to take advantage of it by using it as a backdoor to dating her. The man again looks like his pride has been shattered. He apologizes and admits that she is right. It's just that he has such a good time with her that he never wants it to end. She gives him a sad smile as she closes the car door, and he watches her enter her house before he finally drives away. It's two weeks later when the man's phone rings. It's his friend. She explains that she's been thinking a lot about what he said in the car and that she likes spending time with him too. Maybe there could be something more to their relationship. The man can't believe it. Is this really happening? The woman is serious. 
She'd like to take him up on that dinner offer, if he's still interested. Her treat. She wants to know what he is doing right- Ah! The man suddenly yelps in pain. Is he okay? What was that sound? Yes, I'm fine, it was nothing, the man tells her. It's just that now… now's not a good time. The woman doesn't understand. She thought he'd want to see her. She explains that she's leaving town for a work trip the next day and will be gone for a couple of weeks. She was hoping she could see him before she left, but… The man cries out in pain again. He tells her that he hasn't been feeling well all day, but that he'll be alright. Okay, well, get well soon. I'll call you when I get back. They exchange goodbyes, and the man hangs up the phone. The man looks terrible. His skin is pale, and his face looks hollow and gaunt. He looks down at his arm and sees that the veins themselves appear to be moving, pulsing, and vibrating. He screams again in agony and falls to the floor, clutching his arm. After writhing on the floor, he manages to summon the strength to reach for the phone. His hand searches on the table above him, and eventually he's able to knock it onto the floor. He grabs the phone and starts to dial. Nine. One. Before he can press one again, another wave of intense searing pain consumes him. Several weeks later, the woman is standing outside the man's house. Mail and newspapers are piled up on his front porch, as if no one has been in or out in some time. She knocks on the door, but there's no response. Hello? She calls out, but still nothing. She's very worried. She's tried calling him several times, but he never answered or returned her messages. She tries the doorknob, and to her surprise, the front door swings open. She steps inside and the room is dark. She's also immediately hit by a strong aroma of… pine? She searches on the wall and finds the switch. She turns on the lights, and can't believe what she sees standing in front of her. There in the middle of the room is a massive spruce tree, its upper branches pressing against the ceiling. She reaches out and touches the tree's vivid red branches. They feel sticky and wet. She pulls her hand away and looks down to see that it's covered in a red substance. That's when she notices something else. Stuck among the trunk at the base of the tree is the half-consumed body of her friend. Unfortunately, this pair would never have the opportunity to see their feelings take root and grow, because unbeknownst to them, this beautiful tree is actually a very deadly anomaly, known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-867, but which is perhaps better known by its very appropriate nickname, Blood Spruce. SCP-867 is, or at least appears to be, quite similar to the species of tree Piscea pungens, better known as the Blue Spruce. Of course, there are a number of dramatic differences between 867 and its non-anomalous counterpart. Visually, and most obvious, is the coloration. While blue spruces, as the name implies, are typically a blue-green color, SCP-867 is a deep, vibrant red. There's another major visual difference too, with the blood spruce lacking any sort of seed cones that you would normally expect to find. With no pine cones to protect and spread seeds, you'd be right to ask how SCP-867 goes about reproducing. The answer to that question is what makes this beautiful tree such a dangerous anomaly. The secret to how SCP-867 reproduces is found in its leaves. While they look like pine needles, SCP-867's leaves are, in fact, needles. Their structure is very similar to that of hypodermic needles, and each one contains a single long thin seed which sits above a small gas pocket at the base. When a living creature touches the leaves, the tree immediately reacts. It triggers the gas pocket in the base of the leaf to release, which injects the seed into the skin of whatever touched it. The process is quite similar to that found in auto-injectors, like those used to quickly treat allergic reactions. The seed itself is extremely small, and is coated in a liquid that has both anesthetic and coagulant properties, which makes the process virtually undetectable. Once implanted in the skin, these seeds can lay dormant for up to two weeks before they begin the germination process, and the true horror of SCP-867 is revealed. Once the seeds begin to sprout and grow, they will not seek to penetrate through the skin like a plant rising out of the soil. Instead, the strange plant will grow within its host's body, spreading throughout the circulatory system. This process is extremely painful for the host. The plant's tendrils wind through their veins and capillary system, stretching and pressing against them as the blood spruce grows within them. Eventually, the ever-increasing size of the plant's tendrils becomes too much, and the veins will begin to rupture. This leads to severe internal bleeding, and soon after, the death of the host. The entire process is quite quick, with it only taking 24 hours from when the seeds first sprout to the host dying. 
But that single day will feel like an eternity to the afflicted individual as they feel the plant rapidly growing inside of their body. But even though the host has expired, this parasitoid tree is far from finished with them, or at least, their body. Soon after death, a new instance of the blood spruce will burst from the body. The red tree is quite small at first, but it will continue to quickly grow, just as it did within its host's body, and can reach maturity in just 30 days. And unlike most other plants, SCP-867 is able to grow regardless of light or soil conditions, because it does not produce food via photosynthesis. No, this plant is carnivorous. As it grows, the 867 will slowly consume its host's body until nothing remains except the blood-red tree. Instances of SCP-867 were first identified in Colorado during the 1990s, following reports of numerous disappearances of hikers and park rangers. The SCP Foundation dispatched a team to the area to investigate, and they soon discovered numerous instances of the previously unidentified tree. Several still young specimens were acquired, though unfortunately, this led to the deaths of several agents, who were not yet aware of just how dangerous the red spruces could be. Once their threat level was properly assessed, several specimens were flagged for containment and research purposes, while all of the other identified instances still in the wild were destroyed. The remaining instances of SCP-867 were classified as Euclid and are now securely kept at a Foundation biocontainment site. Direct human contact with the plants is normally not allowed, and remote rovers are used for the majority of tests and upkeep. If for any reason it is necessary for a human to enter 867's containment cell, they are to wear full hazmat suits with a Kevlar underlayer, and upon exiting the cell, must undergo a full herbicidal treatment and inspection. Should any possible puncture marks be discovered, they will be forced to quarantine for no less than 15 days. Ah, nature. It's so beautiful, peaceful, and calming yet seems determined to try and kill us in any number of ways. If you're out hiking or camping in the woods, try to remember this extremely famous adage which I may or may not have just made up. It goes, leaves of three, let them be. Needles of red, well, you're probably already dead. There are no streetlights on this stretch of the old narrow road which runs through a rural part of West Virginia. A car has gone off the road into a ditch and needs to be pulled out, a common task for this tow truck driver and he's often in the area doing similar jobs, though he's never been on this particular road, and he has to keep his eyes peeled for any signs or other markers that might give him an idea of how close he is to his turn. He spots something up ahead, but as he gets closer, he sees that it isn't a road sign, it's a billboard. As he passes by, he can make out the weathered lettering advertising a diner 20 miles down the road that's probably been closed for at least as many years. As he continues driving, he sees more dilapidated billboards, advertising other long-since shuttered businesses like gas stations and auto body shops. But then he sees one on the road ahead of him that's nothing like the others. This one doesn't look old at all, in fact it looks quite new. He drives by and has to question if he saw it correctly. It seemed like all it said was, get away, over and over, and then the name of a road. Is that an invitation or a warning? It wasn't even clear what kind of business it might be advertising. He continues driving, but he can't quit thinking about that strange sign. He even feels compelled to turn around so he can get another look at it. But there's no need, because as he rounds a curve, there's another of the same sign. This time he slows down as he passes to get a better look, and he was right. It just says, get away multiple times with the name of a road. Wagriwa Road. Must be Native American or something. Now he really can't get the billboard out of his mind. What does it mean? What is it advertising? And why is there a third one of them just ahead of him? He pulls his truck to the side of the road, stopping with his headlights illuminating the sign. He gets out of the truck and stands in front of the billboard. It's just the same as the others. Get away, written over and over. Wagriwa Road. He can see now that the background of the sign is a picture of some trees on a gray, cloudy winter day. He also notices for the first time that there's another line at the bottom. Find what you are looking for. What does it mean? Huh? Find what you're looking for on Wagriwa Road? Where even is that? There's no directions, no address, no phone number. He takes a step back from the sign and looks up and down the darkened road. What is he doing out here on the side of the road? Someone is stranded in a ditch waiting for him and he's staring at a billboard? He gets back into the truck, puts it in gear, and drives away. As he continues down the tree-lined rural road, though, he inevitably finds his thoughts turning back to the signs. Get away. But find what you're looking for? Doesn't make any sense. Or are you supposed to get away to Wagriwa Road? Who would put these up? And why do they look so new? Everything else out here looks like it's for a business that shut down years ago. 
What are they trying to... He suddenly slams on his brakes and comes to a screeching stop in the middle of the road. His eyes are locked on what's in front of him. His headlights aren't lighting up another billboard, though. This time, it is a worn road sign. Wagriwa Road. He can't help it. He has to know what's down this road. He has to know what these signs are about. The stuck driver can wait a few minutes longer. He turns his truck onto the narrow gravel road and drives for a few hundred yards, following it around a couple of bends as it winds through the trees until it abruptly ends. There's nothing out here. No buildings, no signs, just what looks to be a dirt path leading deeper into the woods. The tow truck driver switches off the ignition and the road is plunged into darkness. He reaches under his seat and takes out a flashlight before getting out of the truck. He shines the light into the woods surrounding him, but there's nothing to see. No, wait. There is something, and it's coming down the path out of the trees. Phil? Phil, is that you? The figure that stepped out of the woods is talking to him. He shines his flashlight at them, and they raise a hand to shade their eyes from the light. Sharon, what are you doing out here? It's Sharon, the tow truck driver's ex-wife, but he thought she'd moved to Colorado after she remarried. Why would she be here? And what was she doing emerging from the woods? Phil, come here. I need to show you something. He hesitates for just a moment, but then finds that he's walking towards his ex-wife. Before he can reach her, she turns around and starts walking down the path back into the woods, and he follows. He walks just behind her, his flashlight illuminating the path in front of them. He thinks he hears a rustling coming from the woods next to him and searches the trees with his flashlight, but doesn't see anything. Come on, it's just a little further, she says. Where are we going? What's just a little further? What you're looking for? The woods suddenly open up, and he finds that they are standing in a clearing. She stops walking, and he pauses next to her. He opens his mouth to speak, but she quickly shushes him. Quiet, they're almost here. The tow truck driver looks around, but he doesn't see anything, just the faint outline of trees that are barely visible on this moonless night. But then he watches as several creatures begin to emerge out of the woods into the clearing. They're... deer? He watches as just a few come towards him at first, but then he notices that they have completely surrounded him. There must be over twenty. Turn off your light, she tells him. He obeys, and in the darkness he can see now that there is something special about these deer. Their eyes are glowing with a pale white light. One of the smaller deer steps forward and cautiously approaches him. He squats down and holds his hand out, showing it that he means it no harm. The deer looks back nervously at a larger one that he thinks must be its mother. It looks like it nods in approval, and the smaller deer moves closer. He can clearly see its big, beautiful doe eyes glow brightly in the dark. You're okay, he says, and leans forward to give it a reassuring pet when... Following the mysterious disappearances of multiple people in an area of West Virginia near the town of Harper's Ferry, the SCP Foundation soon became interested in a particular stretch of road where it appeared that many of those who had gone missing had traveled just prior to their vanishing. Agents were dispatched to the area and immediately detected high levels of thaumaturgic energy, with the epicenter appearing to be on a plot of privately owned land. Investigation of local records revealed that the land was owned by a man named Richard Redkin. The Foundation staff contacted Mr. Redkin under the guise of being federal agents investigating a crime that had been committed on the property while he was away. Mr. Redkin happily cooperated with the agents, explaining to them that he had never experienced any abnormal events on the property while he was living there, but that he had not resided on the land for some time. Strangely, he claimed to not know the road as Wagriwa Road, insisting that as far as he knew it had never had an official name, being nothing more than a long driveway out to his property. When asked if he could remember anything else abnormal about the location, he told the agents no, but that his daughter had written many fictional stories about strange happenings on the land, and perhaps those had somehow turned into rumors and then urban legends, though that was a long time ago. When the agents requested to meet with the daughter, he explained that it was impossible. She had drowned many years prior in the nearby Shenandoah River. The agents again examined the local records and found that Mr. Redkin wasn't lying. His daughter really had passed away, and her body was found in the river. The timing of this accident was quite coincidental, though, as it had occurred exactly one week before the first missing person in the area was reported. Quickly realizing that something was not quite right with this piece of land, the SCP Foundation authorized the purchase from Mr. Redkin, who was more than happy to sell, and a research outpost was constructed to further investigate the anomalous events, which had collectively been dubbed SCP-4434. While exploring the surrounding area, they soon found what so many others had before. The bizarre billboards, imploring one to both get away 
as well as come to Wagriwa Road to find what you are looking for. The signs, which were designated as SCP-4434-A, were found on roads across the West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia tri-state area, but their locations would often change, with the billboards only manifesting for short amounts of time before vanishing and reappearing elsewhere. Bizarrely, when attempts were made to photograph or videotape the signs, the resulting footage would show only a blank, white sign. The Foundation knew that they needed to investigate further, and several experiments were authorized to find just what was happening on the land at the end of the mysterious road. A D-Class personnel, D-84021, was given a radio and implanted with GPS locators in his neck, torso, and thigh, and sent down the road with orders to report back on what they experienced, though unlike the people who had gone missing, he was not shown the billboard prior to entering the area. The D-Class walked to the end of the road, where he reported that a creature was emerging from a path leading into the woods. He soon exclaimed that the creature was a dog that he used to own. The researchers monitoring the test were confused since the dog had apparently been deceased for some time, and yet, here it was standing in front of him. Although the D-Class had seemed hesitant at the start of the mission, once he saw his childhood dog, all of his fears were set aside, and he willingly followed it deeper into the forest. After 90 seconds, the D-Class reported that he had entered a clearing and was being surrounded by a group of deer. The reports stopped soon after and were replaced by the sound of screams as D-84021 was attacked and apparently consumed by the deer. Two of the three GPS trackers remained active for the next 40 minutes, and SCP researchers followed their path as they moved to the middle of the clearing and then appeared to enter a sinkhole or cave of some sort, where they traveled slowly in a winding pattern downward until contact was lost. Following this test, the Foundation researchers suspected that the creature that would emerge from the woods, which had been designated as SCP-4434-B, was able to change forms into one that would be trusted by those who entered the 4434 area. The deer, on the other hand, seemed to always maintain their appearance, and the whole group was designated as SCP-4434-C. The tests were far from over, though. For the next, two D-classes were sent into SCP-4434 in order to see what form 4434-B would take when more than one person was present. Just like before, an entity emerged from the woods, but this time, it took the form of a young man in a suit who immediately offered to clear any and all debts the D-Classes held, as well as expunging their criminal records, freeing them from their life as test subjects. All they would need do is follow him into the woods. The agents monitoring the test ordered the D-Classes not to follow the man, but they were ignored, and the researchers listened as they instead began conversing with SCP-4434-B, seeming to be quite interested in his offer. They soon followed him into the woods, and just over two minutes later, they too were attacked and consumed by SCP-4434-C. It appeared now that once someone entered the SCP-4434 area, they were all but helpless to resist the compulsive effects of SCP-4434-B. The Foundation researchers wanted to test the limits of SCP-4434's power, and so they then came up with a rather creative procedure for the next test. Another D-Class personnel was sent down the road, but this one was wearing a body harness that was connected to a pulley system, as well as being equipped with a camera. He was ordered to wait at the edge of the SCP-4434 area until the 4434-B entity appeared. The entity soon emerged, taking the form of a middle-aged woman. As soon as the D-Class was seen conversing with the entity and agreed to follow it, the pulley was engaged in order to forcibly pull him out of the area. This was followed by an entirely unexpected event. The middle-aged woman quickly produced a knife and, with a supernatural speed, severed the rope on the pulley system. The now-free D-Class stood up, followed the woman into the woods, and was consumed soon after. The researchers were growing frustrated with their lack of advancement in understanding the anomaly, and so for the fourth test, they decided to take quite extreme measures. A drone was used to fly over the area, which identified the mouth of the cave that the GPS trackers had been taken into. It was a three and a half meter wide hole in the ground, too dark to see anything past the entrance, and the drone installed an anchor point in the ground at the mouth of the hole before flying in to explore further. But the signal was almost immediately lost. Progress had been made, though. Yet another D-Class was selected, this time one who had climbing experience. D-84041 was warned in advance that the SCP-4434-B entity would appear to her and would have a compulsive effect, and that she was to ignore them no matter what form they took and instead proceed as quickly as possible to the cave, which had been designated as SCP-4434-D. D-84041 was taken to the road, and she immediately began running down the path into the woods. She was able to reach the mouth of the cave without seeing any anomalous entities, neither 4434-B nor the carnivorous deer. 
She quickly attached the rope she had brought to the anchor that was installed by the drone and began rappelling into the hole. As she descended down, she described the normal, rocky cave, one that grew wetter the further down she went. Surprisingly, she soon reached the bottom, where she found a spherical room, roughly 8 meters across. But this was not anything like the entrance to the cave. The floor of this room wasn't made of rock or dirt. It was more like flesh, and it appeared to be breathing. And there was something else down there, too. A folded piece of paper with writing on it. The D-Class was ordered to pick up the paper, take a sample of the cave floor, and exit the area as soon as possible, as there was no way to predict if the SCP-4434-B and C entities, or something worse, would soon appear. After taking a sample, she began climbing out of the cave. When she emerged, there were still no signs of any anomalous creatures, but she quickly made her way down the road and out of the SCP-4434 area. When she reached the waiting agents at the edge of the area, D-84041 handed them the sample and the paper that she found, but then stopped and turned around. There on the ground roughly 5 meters away was a plate of food. Without any hesitation, she walked back into the SCP-4434 area, picked up the plate, and walked back into the woods. She was never seen again. It was now clear that 4434-B could take forms other than just humanoids and animals. As the objects that the D-Class had managed to get out of SCP-4434 were analyzed, the area's former owner, Richard Redkin, was again questioned by Foundation agents. They asked him if there was anything he failed to mention in their previous interview, and he told them that there was one thing that he preferred not to normally discuss. Just before his daughter's death, in addition to her fascination with writing and coming up with stories, she had become obsessed with the occult. When they asked him about the paper they had found within SCP-4434-D, he told them that it was very likely that she had written it. The SCP Foundation now understood why they had detected so many thaumaturgic particles in the area, which is the residual energy left over from a particular form of ritualistic practice that is more commonly known as magic or witchcraft. The contents of the paper found in the cave seemed to add additional weight to the theory that his daughter may have been involved in a ritual that led to the creation of SCP-4434, because written on the single page is a poem which reads, The forest is a sea, the wind is the waves, and the water is the leaves. The streams become undercurrents, the birds become fish, and coral finds its home as fungus, growth sprouting as I wish. The ground is the shore, pulling me by the feet, dragging me down, and pulling me back, back and forth on repeat. I dove down past the light, down where I couldn't breathe, and found nature looking for a fight. Yes, the forest is a sea, but I've made it barely big enough for me. The forest is a sea, so now something's bound to come eat. Things only became more mysterious, though, when Foundation researchers performed a DNA test on the sample taken from the bottom of the SCP-4434-D cave. What they found was that it was, just as D-84041 had described, a flesh-like substance, and that it was a 78.9% match to Melanocetus johnsoni, better known as the deep-sea anglerfish. And there was one final discovery to be made as well. Linguistic teams within the Foundation investigated the name of the road that had appeared on the SCP-4434-A billboards, and discovered that the word was very similar to the Native American Tutelo tribe word Wagriwa, which roughly translates to the phrase, I have come back. A small convertible sports car rumbles down a desert road, kicking up a cloud of dust high into the air behind it. The driver is sharply dressed, and looks at himself in the rearview mirror giving his sunglasses a slight adjustment. He knows he looks as good as he feels. And why shouldn't the producer of Hollywood's ninth most successful film in the month of September be happy? The car comes to a sudden stop in front of a cluster of buildings, which appear to be the only structures in this vast, otherwise empty desert. The producer hops out of the car and surveys the desolate location, the cracked concrete airstrip, the weather-beaten buildings, the endless, lonely desert stretching on for miles in every direction. This place is great! the producer says out loud to no one in particular. The whole location would be perfect for his new movie, which is set entirely at a desert airstrip, and tells the story of a lonely airplane mechanic who falls in love with a female bounty hunter chasing an escaped convict, a tale as old as time. But now, where's the guy who called him? He kept rambling about wanting to make a documentary about the desert or something, but that doesn't matter now. He doesn't realize what a great filming location he's sitting on. The producer calls out, Hello? but the only response is the desert breeze. He takes off his sunglasses and looks around. He sees that the doors to the hangar are cracked. Maybe the guy who owns this place is in there. The producer walks inside the hangar, but abruptly stops. 
His mouth goes agape. He can't believe what he's seeing. This place is even better than the guy on the phone had described it. The hangar is huge and completely empty. He could probably build almost all the sets in the hangar, maybe even shoot the entire picture out here. He'd save a fortune on the budget by not having to pay the soundstage rates that the studios charge on the movie lots in LA. You beautiful genius, he thinks to himself. The movie could flop and still be a financial success. But where's the guy who called him? Doesn't he know who he is? He's a very important producer and doesn't have time to wait around for some desert nobody who runs a two-bit airport. All right, that's it. He's leaving. The producer turns to leave, but the doors of the hangar suddenly slide shut with a bang. Is this some kind of joke? He walks up to the hangar doors and starts banging on them, but they don't move. Hello? Hey, I'm trapped in here. What's the big deal? Still no response. Just what is going on at this place? The producer is getting worried. Was this some kind of a setup? Is he about to get robbed? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they took his car. He's nine payments behind on it anyway. But geez, is it hot in here. It was hot outside, but it's even worse in this hangar. And whoever said that the desert air was dry? An idiot, that's who. The humidity in here is stifling. The producer loosens his collar and tugs at it, trying to cool off. All right, I've had just about enough. If you don't let me out of here, there's going to be a big problem for you, fella. Just then, the producer hears a noise behind him, coming from the dark deeper in the hangar. The producer doesn't react, though. He needs to play it cool. He bends down and pretends to tie his shoe, and takes the Derringer pistol out of his ankle holster. He stands up and spins around, pointing the gun in front of him, but he can't see anyone in the darkness. This is your last chance. I'm not playing around here. The strange noise comes again, a low rumbling noise, and the producer stumbles forward. What just happened? It felt like the floor rippled and pushed him forward. There, it happened again. And again, the producer screams. What's going on? The rumbling, growling noise grows louder as the floor keeps rippling and pushing him forward, like a wave rolling through the solid ground. Is this an earthquake? The producer is knocked off his feet, and still the floor keeps pushing him forward, towards where that horrible growling noise is coming from. He tries to stand, but he can't. The floor is moving too much. He tries to crawl, but keeps getting moved closer and closer to the source of the now deafening roar that seems to be coming from… What is that? The producer screams and fires his gun at the thing in front of him. In the flashes of the gunfire, he can finally see it, the thing that he's being pushed into, a giant, gaping maw, filled with a mass of gnashing, grinding teeth. How unlucky for this movie producer that he didn't realize until it was too late that the location for his new movie would be the last one that he'd ever scout. Because as you have probably already figured out, this unknown building in the middle of the desert isn't at all what it appears to be. And in fact, is quite known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1051. SCP-1051 isn't actually a building at all, but in fact, is a living organism. This creature's shell, which resembles an aircraft hangar, is quite large and measures roughly 700 meters by 500 meters by 60 meters. It is a completely immobile organism and acts as an ambush predator, luring its prey to it through a number of different forms of sociological and psychological manipulation. SCP-1051 attempts to bring prey to it in a number of ways, but its primary method is by spreading certain ideas into popular culture. It will constantly try to connect to orbiting satellites and use them to beam out television signals, images, and other forms of media. It has been measured as having around a 25% success rate in connecting with and getting its message carried by the satellites, and may have the ability to transmit regular radio broadcasts or connect to standard telephone lines as well. The messages that SCP-1051 sends out tend to fall into the category that could be termed as conspiracy theories, most of which are about itself. It has uploaded information to various conspiracy websites that has included reports of spaceships being held and reverse-engineered in its hangar, descriptions of so-called men in black using its location as a site for extraterrestrial contact. It has attempted to spread rumors that it is a site used as a testing location for any number of top-secret devices including energy weapons, weather control devices, teleportation machines, and impossible propulsion systems. SCP-1051 has also attempted to spread through radio and television transmissions that it is a site used by a United States shadow government. It's made at least a handful of calls to Hollywood-based production companies in an attempt to get them to further spread its information, as well as contacting various tabloid newspapers. Perhaps most nefarious of all, 
It has even sent orders to U.S. military intelligence operatives posing as a senior official and ordering them to reveal SCP-1051's location. SCP-1051 appears desperate to make its location known to curious outsiders, all in an attempt to get them to come find it, so it can lure them inside of itself and feed. And the anatomical structure of SCP-1051 is perfectly suited to this task. Its bizarre biological structure consists of a large tongue, which looks very similar to a paved runway. The tongue leads directly into a set of large airplane hangar doors that could be called the organism's mouth. This door mouth opens up to what looks like a hangar, but is actually the gizzard-like organ of 1051, where it grinds its prey into a fine paste to prepare it for digestion. The next building is the creature's stomach, where it breaks down the liquefied prey into nutrients and separates the waste products that it can't digest. The nutrients are transported to the area where SCP-1051's brain is thought to reside, while the waste is ejected out of the structure. Finally, there are what appears to be a set of antenna on the side of the building. These information distribution organs extend below the ground as well, where many more antenna and wires are thought to exist, and give 1051 the ability to send out multiple television, radio, and other signals. SCP-1051 was discovered in 1947, when an egg-shaped structure was reported to have crash-landed in the desert of the American Southwest, near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. The United States Air Force took this strange egg into its possession and moved it to its current location in Nevada for observation and research. The Air Force scientists who were assigned to the object first thought that they were dealing with a meteorite, the one that was composed of some yet unknown material. They soon discovered that the object was hollow and was filled with some kind of liquid. Strangest of all, though, was when they detected something inside that liquid core. And it was moving. They studied the object for years, until one day, something happened that would end their research for good. The egg hatched. One night, as Air Force Sergeant Burnson and two scientists, Dr. James and Dr. Gold, were going about their regular work analyzing the object, they heard a strange sound. When they looked at the object, they saw that a crack had begun to form on the outer shell. This cracking continued for about five minutes, until something finally broke through the shell. An alien creature began to emerge from its shell, and the men all turned to run, but something reached out with a long tentacle-like arm and grabbed Dr. James. It pulled the scientist in and seemed to absorb him right into its body. Sergeant Burnson and Dr. Gold managed to escape the airplane hangar and send out a distress signal, and it was this cry for help that described an attack by an alien creature that would put the object firmly on the SCP Foundation's radar. As Sergeant Burnson was sending out the distress signal, Dr. Gold tapped him on the shoulder and pointed towards the hangar where the egg-like object had been stored. The two men watched as the hangar bulged and expanded, like something was pressing against the walls from inside. The hangar suddenly collapsed, and they watched as the creature looked to writhe around in the debris. But then a new shell began to form around the alien. It grew larger, expanding and shifting until suddenly, it took on nearly the exact form as the hangar that once stood there. SCP Foundation agents arrived at the site not long after and took control of the area. They discovered almost immediately that the building-shaped creature was anything but dormant. This extraterrestrial that had been born from an egg and then taken the form of an airplane hangar was ejecting its own eggs. The building would occasionally blast eggs up and into the sky. Several of these eggs were stopped and reclaimed by the Foundation, but others managed to slip past and escape the Earth's atmosphere, making them impossible to recover. The Foundation also soon detected that radio signals were being emitted by the hangar, and set up a small radio nearby which would allow them to both receive and send signals back to the creature that was now designated as SCP-1051. Dr. Richardson, the Foundation researcher on site who was leading the investigation into 1051, found the frequency that it was transmitting on and attempted to speak to the creature. After asking if 1051 could hear it, the creature actually responded and it seemed to have a very simple request, give. When Dr. Richardson asked it to elaborate, asking, give what? 1051 responded, want feed, bring food. When the doctor told 1051 that it wouldn't be getting any food, the anomaly immediately sent out a new transmission, stating, Area 51 is currently being controlled by the SCP Foundation, a shadow government organization that has designated it SCP-1051, here are a few names of the operatives. 
Dr. Richardson cut SCP-1051 off and ordered a D-Class personnel to be sent inside the creature, hopefully appeasing it and stopping it from sending any more broadcasts out about the highly secretive organization. When asked why it was sending these signals, SCP-1051 responded that it was trying to make humans curious. It appeared that its hunting strategy was to flood the world with conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories about itself. This would then cause interested humans to come explore the location, and once they entered the hangar, their curiosity would reward them with an encounter with the alien that they had been seeking. SCP-1051 also explained that the eggs that it was ejecting were its babies, and it seemed quite upset that the Foundation had intercepted some of them as they were on their orbital escape trajectory. But where had SCP-1051 come up with these conspiracy theories? Had it been studying our culture and the boom of science fiction in the 1940s to make up stories it thought would lead people to it? Foundation researcher Dr. Richardson had a hunch that there was something else going on. He next spoke to Dr. Gold, the other Air Force scientist who had been studying the egg-shaped meteorite. He asked him to describe SCP-1051's first victim, Dr. James. Dr. Gold told him that Dr. James was obsessed with his job and that spread into his personal life. He was a real sci-fi nut. Dr. James apparently loved B-movies, especially ones about aliens and UFOs. He was convinced that the government had both in their possession already, and his research on the strange, egg-shaped meteorite only added to his confidence in that fact. Had SCP-1051 somehow absorbed this knowledge from its first meal here on Earth, and was now using it as a way to lure in new, inquisitive prey? Dr. Richardson thought it may go even deeper than that. When he played a recording of the first conversation he'd had with SCP-1051 for Dr. Gold, the one where 1051 told him it wanted him to bring food, Dr. Gold was left shocked. The voice he was hearing belonged to Dr. James. SCP-1051 remains in the Nevadan Desert, and its area is patrolled at all times by no less than 20 Foundation personnel in uniforms that resemble those worn by members of the United States Air Force. They are authorized to shoot at intruders, but not with the intention to kill, instead, only as a means to scare them away. Should any intruders come within one kilometer of SCP-1051, they are to be detained and administered Class A amnestics. Since SCP-1051's primary danger stems from its ability to spread false information, the SCP Foundation's main containment efforts have been focused on stopping its broadcasts. Agents are to respond to any civilian rumors or questions about SCP-1051 with denial and ridicule, to make it clear that these are nothing but stories and that the person is stupid for believing them. Should they exhibit any knowledge beyond the normal myths and rumors, the application of Class A amnestics is also permitted. Any satellites orbiting near 1051's location are to be monitored for interference to their transmissions, and if any antenna with an unknown purpose are discovered within a 10-kilometer area of the building, they are to be destroyed or surrounded by a Faraday cage. SCP-1051 may not be able to move, but its ability to reproduce and the difficulty that the Foundation still faces in stopping its spread of disinformation has led to it being classified as Euclid, and research into its origins and biology are ongoing. You and your friends exit a club and step onto the darkened city street. Everyone is in a happy and joyful mood. It's been a great night, one that you'll be reminiscing about with your friends for years. As you walk and laugh together, you don't notice the large man standing in front of you and almost run straight into him. You offer a quick apology and move to go around the man, but he steps in front of you, blocking your path. All of your friends grow quiet and you finally take a good look at the man. The man towers over you. He is huge, with giant elaborate tattoos wrapped around his bulging muscles that it looks like he may have gotten to cover up the numerous white patches of skin that are missing pigmentation. His face, though, is bright red and filled with rage. The man begins screaming at you, asking why you ran into him and calling you horrible names. Again, you try to apologize, but the man just keeps yelling as if he can't even hear you. He pushes you hard in the chest, and you fall back into one of your friends. Another steps forward in an attempt to defuse the situation, but the man punches him in the face, breaking his jaw. A melee ensues, though it could more accurately be described as a massacre. The man has gone ballistic and punches, kicks, and bites your entire group of friends. His strength seems unreal, even for someone as big and muscular as him. A large bouncer runs over in an attempt to break up the fight, but even he is no match for this tattooed giant. You've been on the ground since he shoved you, 
watching this insanity play out. But now, with everyone else lying on the ground bloodied and bruised, he turns his attention back on you. You try to scramble back to your feet, but he's upon you in an instant. He picks you up over his head and tosses you into some trash cans, knocking you unconscious. You open your eyes to see the man standing over you. You can feel the blood from numerous cuts on your face running down into your eyes and mouth. The man picks you up with one hand and holds you by the throat against the wall. He's still in a rage, breathing hard through clenched teeth, bits of white foaming in the corners of his mouth as he brings up his other hand and curls his fingers into a fist. All you can think is, is this it? But then you notice something. The tattoo that snakes down the man's arm all the way to his hand is moving. The long serpentine dragon is writhing and slithering as if it's alive. Is this really happening? Or just a result of the concussive trauma you've received? There's no time to consider it further though, as the man pulls back and throws a punch right into your face. You can feel your nose flatten and break from the impact, which understandably distracts you from the bizarre occurrence that follows. Right as the man's bloodied fist makes contact with your face, the dragon on his arm seems to swim off of his skin and onto yours. Like a snake moving through water, it glides off his fist onto your face before sliding down your neck onto your body. There is a searing pain as it moves, like you're being poked with needles over and over. You scream from the pain, blood from your broken nose pouring out of your mouth. The man drops you to the ground and steps back. He no longer looks to be in a rage and instead looks confused. He looks down at his skin to find that the tattoo is completely gone. A look of unbridled joy comes over his face, and he turns and runs away into the night, laughing with glee as he does so. You are left whimpering in pain, curled up in a ball in the pile of trash where he left you, the dragon tattoo now covering your entire body. As you have probably already guessed, this is no normal tattoo. No, this is an anomalous creature that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-021, but it also has another name, the skin worm. SCP-021 is an obligate parasite that uses the human body as a host. Its visual appearance is in the form of a large, elaborate tattoo of an oriental-style dragon, which covers roughly one square meter of its host's skin. What makes this tattoo truly unique is that it is fully animated and moves on the host's body just as a real animal would, though in 2D like a cartoon playing out in real time on their skin. The movement of the tattoo causes horrendous pain for the host, and has been described as feeling like thousands of tiny needles are stabbing at them all at once, as if a fresh image is being constantly tattooed on their skin, while at the same time, a tattoo removal process is happening. While the tattoo organism is able to move, it seems to prefer spending most of its time on its host's torso, though it has been seen to move around to other parts of the body on occasion. As SCP-021 moves around on the surface of its host's body, it appears to feed on the pigments in the skin. Its favored meal seems to be other tattoos, which it will seek out and devour, though if none are present, or if it has eaten all of the tattoos on its host, it will begin consuming the melanin from the skin instead. Melanin is a naturally occurring pigment found in human skin, and after SCP-021 sucks it from its host, it will leave them with permanent skin damage and patches of unpigmented skin that appear similar to that of the skin condition vitiligo. The feeding itself does not appear to cause the host any pain, and the pigments, whether they are from another tattoo or the natural ones in the skin, will simply disappear as 021 eats them. The pace at which SCP-021 feeds will vary, but it has been observed as being able to clear over half a square meter of skin in roughly one hour. One way to prevent SCP-021 from eating all of the melanin present on a human is to quickly add new tattoos of fruits or small animals as a way to continually distract it from turning to the melanin. Thus far, outside of motion, the organism has displayed no elevated intelligence or the ability to communicate. It simply moves and feeds. SCP-021 is not permanently affixed to the skin of any one host, and in fact, can be transferred back and forth between hosts multiple times. The only way to transfer the organism is through physical contact, though skin-to-skin -skin contact does not guarantee that the organism will take to a new host. In the event that it does, the dragon tattoo appears to swim across the touching skin and will affix itself to the new human host. 
Skin-to-skin contact in the, um, romantic sense has been shown to be the most reliable method of transfer from one host to another, with a 93% rate of successful transmission. However, as you can imagine, the tattooing sensation that comes along with any movement of SCP-021 means that this particular transfer is extremely painful for all parties involved, and the Foundation has deemed that despite its high success rate, it should only be used when absolutely necessary. Contact between two open wounds has been shown to be an only slightly less effective method, and has become the default means of transferring when the SCP Foundation wants to move SCP-021 from one host to another. Transferring the organism from a deceased host to a living one is possible, though more complicated. SCP-021 appears not to mind when its host organism is no longer alive, continuing to feed on whatever pigments are available to it, and does not seem to suffer any ill effect from the condition of its host. It is as yet unknown whether SCP-021 could be transferred to another species. So far, the organism has only been willing to move from human to human, though research into the question is ongoing. It's theorized that if SCP-021 is able to exist on a non-human animal, it would only occur in the rarest of circumstances. Unlike most parasites, SCP-021 does offer some small but tangible benefits to its host human. In addition to hosts of the organism appearing to have an improved immune system, research has also shown that the presence of 021 will increase its host's release and reuptake of epinephrine, better known as adrenaline. It will also decrease the buildup of lactic acid, which is what builds up in the muscles during activity and causes burning sensations and soreness. Combined, these benefits from SCP-021 provide its host with increased strength and confidence, as well as give a heightened pain tolerance during stressful situations. Not surprisingly, the host of SCP-021 also displays a high level of aggression, though whether this comes from their elevated hormone levels or simply because the organism causes them to be in constant pain is still an unanswered question. The amount of time that this symbiotic relationship can be sustained is typically limited to how long the host can tolerate the unceasing pain of the tattoo moving about their body. The persistent agony that a host of SCP-021 endures has led to multiple hosts having taken their own lives, and in a few rare cases, they have also succumbed to fatal skin infections. Though these were likely the result of open wounds caused by the hosts scratching at their own skin, rather than anything directly attributable to the organism. SCP-021 is currently contained on the body of a D-Class personnel, D-139, who is housed in Standard Detention Cell 217A, and the relative ease with which it can be kept on a human subject's body has led to it receiving the safe classification. Only D-Class personnel are eligible to be a host to SCP-021, and current operating procedure is to allow the organism to live on the same host's body until they expire. The exact nature of what SCP-021 is, as well as its origins, remain a mystery to the Foundation. Attempts have been made to trace the path of its transmission from before its time in containment, and it is hypothesized that the organism could be many hundreds of years old, if not older. As evidenced by its low SCP number, 021 is one of the oldest SCPs that the Foundation keeps contained, and it has proven to be a very useful educational tool for new and upcoming researchers as they study this bizarre creature and its existence that occurs entirely within two dimensions. A scientist sits in his lab working on an experiment when the door suddenly opens and a tall, hard-nosed man enters. The scientist hastily stands up and salutes the general who oversees the scientist's entire program. The general dispenses with formalities and tells the scientist that he's being assigned to something new. Before the scientist can even ask what it is he'll be working on, the general gives a small wave of his hand and two soldiers appear in the doorway. They are each holding the side of a large metal box, and from the strained expression on their faces, it's clear that the box is very heavy. They set the box down on the scientist's heavy wooden desk with a loud thud before stepping away from it. The scientist looks over the bulky lead case that's been brought to him, no idea of what could be waiting inside. Be very careful with this, the general says before handing a folder full of papers to the scientist. The scientist, unsure of how to respond, moves his hand to salute the general, but he has already turned on his heel and started to exit the small lab, followed closely behind by the two soldiers. The scientist looks over the folder that was given to him. There's nothing on the cover, so he opens it and starts looking inside, skimming over the long, dry paragraphs that say nothing at all and seem to be included in every government report for some reason. Ah, there it is. Contents. One 6.2 kilogram sphere of plutonium-239. Plutonium-239? 
He's been doing research in this army-run research lab for some time and knows exactly what this is. A sphere of plutonium-239 can only be one thing. A core for a new atomic bomb. Two were already dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and their never-before-seen power caused death and destruction on a truly horrendous level. But they had also helped to put an end to the Second World War, potentially saving the lives of thousands or even millions more. And no matter what moral questions he had about it, this was his job. And as an expert in physics and chemistry, his research would potentially help put a stop to fighting in the future. After all, no one would dare go to war when they knew their opponent had weapons that could cause devastation on this scale, right? The scientist pours over the typewritten records, reading each and every handwritten note in the margins. As he reads through them, he sees warnings about the experiments from the report's unnamed author. There are references to how slim the safety margins are when handling the material for testing. Since the core is intended to be used in a new nuclear weapon, it needs to be right on the edge of supercriticality, the point where fissile material undergoes a chain reaction that is key to nuclear detonations. The report then describes an experiment where the core was to be surrounded with bricks made of tungsten carbide that would act as a mirror of sorts, bouncing neutrons back at the core, which would knock loose other neutrons. The experiment was to be stopped before the core went supercritical, but when the scientist turns the page to view the results, he finds… nothing. There's no more pages in the folder. The scientist had heard rumors about these types of experiments. Tickling the dragon's tail, they called it. But where were the rest of the reports? Was this really the last experiment that was done? He sees at the top of the page that this last experiment was performed over a year ago. Just then, the scientist sure. notices someone walking by in the hall. It's the general. He runs out into the hallway, waving the report at him. General! General! The general stops and turns around clearly annoyed at being intercepted while on the way from one important meeting to another. General, what happened in the last experiment? The general somehow looks even more annoyed by the question. Don't worry about it, he barks back at the scientist. His time on the project was finished. It's yours now. And with that, the general leaves the scientist standing in the hall with his incomplete file. Days pass, and the scientist receives additional orders on what types of experiments he should be carrying out. All of them are designed to guarantee that the core of plutonium will be suitable for use in a new weapon. For the latest test, he's performing an experiment not dissimilar to the last one described in the report, but instead of using tungsten carbide bricks to reflect neutrons back at the core and achieve criticality, a beryllium dome had been created, which is to be lowered down over the sphere of plutonium. As he lowers the dome, he knows that if it were to close completely, it would cause the core to go supercritical in an instant. In order to prevent this, he uses a screwdriver to prop up one side of the dome, allowing just enough neutrons to escape so that the core can maintain its stability. As he lowers the dome just a small amount more, he starts to hear something. It's a faint noise at first, but gradually grows more and more audible. Radioactivity produces no sound, so the scientist is confused, especially since it sounds like the noise is coming from inside the dome. But surely that's impossible. There were no processes happening within that should be creating any sort of noise. The scientist bends down and lifts up the edge of the dome ever so slightly more, just enough so that he can peek inside. As he does, the sound grows louder. He looks right into the core of plutonium-239 and sees something. There is movement on the sphere. He knows this is impossible, but he can see them with his own eyes. Images dancing on the surface of the plutonium sphere. They were faces, unnatural faces, contorted and twisted in pain. He can see now that these are the source of the sound he was hearing, because the faces are screaming. The scientist jumps back, and the screwdriver slips away from the edge of the beryllium dome, allowing it to fall and completely cover the plutonium. Out in the hallway, a security guard covers his eyes, momentarily blinded by the flash of intense blue light. When his vision returns, he runs into the laboratory it came from. The exposed sphere of plutonium sits on the desk, and the security guard looks up to see that the dome that once covered it has been embedded into the ceiling. He hears a moan come from the other side of the desk and rushes around to help the scientist, but when he looks down at the ground, he doesn't see a man. Lying there on the floor is a charred and bloody body, the small amount of skin and flesh that is left sloughing off his body. The scientist reaches toward him with a skeletal hand, emitting one final groan before collapsing. Nuclear weapons have claimed many lives, not just those who suffered directly from their overwhelming destructive energy or the subsequent residual radiation known as fallout, but many of those who researched and developed the science and technology behind them also became victims of their incredible, almost otherworldly power. Today's anomaly is an example of exactly that 
combining the astonishing power of nuclear weapons with the world of the supernatural. This is SCP-095-FR, the Demon Core. SCP-095-FR is a 6.2 kilogram sphere, 89 millimeters in diameter, that is composed entirely of plutonium-239. Despite at one point seeming to be a normal sphere of the plutonium isotope, SCP-095-FR now seems to be in a permanent, self-sustaining state of criticality. This results in a near-constant emission of alpha radiation, which is powerful enough to damage any electrical circuits within a 20-meter radius. The sphere's danger grows the closer you get to it, too. Within a 10-meter radius, any living tissue will become extremely irradiated, leading to radiation sickness, while denser materials like metal or bone will themselves become extremely radioactive. The plutonium sphere is somehow able to maintain a consistent mass, despite its state, which should lead to a decrease in overall mass. It's theorized that it may be undergoing some sort of regenerative process, though it's been impossible to determine just how this might be occurring. SCP-095-FR was recovered from the seafloor near Bikini Atoll, which was the site of a series of nuclear weapon tests by the United States government known as Operation Crossroad. These and later tests, including the Castle Bravo test, resulted in the island chain becoming extremely irradiated, and many of the island's residents soon showed signs of acute radiation syndrome, leading to much of the indigenous population being forced to relocate. Following the Operation Crossroad test, an anomalously high source of radiation was detected in the sea. Though records are incomplete, it appears that the core of plutonium that had been responsible for the deaths of multiple scientists had somehow ended up on the ocean floor. Whether it got there due to being part of a failed bomb detonation, or if it somehow appeared there by other, more anomalous means, is unknown. But regardless of how it got there, the attempted recovery of the object led to the deaths of several American service members from radiation-related illnesses, which the SCP Foundation soon learned of. After assisting in the retrieval of the sphere, the plutonium was relinquished to the Foundation's custody for containment. The SCP-095-FR sphere was placed under the purview of the French branch of the SCP Foundation, owing to their having a readily available site for containment, where the sphere was stored in a lead-lined radiation-blocking safe and classified as Euclid. Only D-Class were permitted to transport and handle the plutonium, since its effects amounted to a death sentence for anyone who got too close. They were also responsible for transferring the sphere to a new safe every six months, due to the damage it was causing them from constant bombardment of radiation. All of these containment procedures would have to be changed, though, following the events of January 7, 2015. On that day, 69 years after it first took the lives of two scientists at the Los Alamos laboratory, and despite it being a scientific impossibility, the Demon Core suddenly went supercritical all on its own. The resulting explosion was estimated to be roughly 33 kilotons, or about twice the power of the atomic bombs that had been detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nearly the entire site housing SCP-095-FR was destroyed, along with 14 other safe and Euclid-class anomalies, and in the end, the death count totaled 285, with casualties coming from either the blast itself, the collapse of structures on the site, or from the resulting radiation poisoning. Incredibly, the sphere itself survived the explosion, showing no signs that it had detonated with the force of a nuclear weapon when it was recovered from the site's wreckage. Foundation researchers studying the Demon Core determined that it was likely to explode again in roughly 50 years, and that the only discernible difference measured in the core before it suddenly went supercritical and destroyed the Foundation site was a sudden spike in radiation. Foundation scientists have no idea how the Demon Core survived, or how it detonated without warning. Some theorize that it may exist in some kind of time loop, which would potentially explain its explosion regeneration cycle, and that it is possible the core has actually detonated several times before entering into Foundation custody. But perhaps the bigger question when it comes to the Demon Core and why it has become such a dangerous object is why. Is there something contained within this seemingly cursed sphere of plutonium? Is it a part of those who have been impacted by the quest to harness the power of atomic energy somehow contained within? Now desperate to get out and unleash their anger on the world? Research continues, but due to the extreme danger that comes from working with the anomaly, it's likely these questions will remain unanswered for some time. Following the destruction of the Foundation site, SCP-095-FR was reclassified to Keter and moved to an underground bunker designed to withstand an explosion equivalent to a standard atomic bomb, which it is hoped will be enough to contain the blast that is almost inevitably going to happen again. 
It's a sobering thought, even for those of us who work with and around anomalies on a daily basis, to be reminded of the incredible destructive power of nuclear weapons. Some of the most feared and deadly anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation pale in comparison to the carnage that we've inflicted on ourselves. And it's important to remember that sometimes the true demons are found inside of us. A construction worker puts the final nail into the wall of the room he's working on. He stands up and admires his work. This is going to be a beautiful hotel one day. A true triumph for not just him, but the entire country. And he's proud that he got to play a small part in its construction. He starts to pack up his tools. There's plenty more rooms that need work. It's a massive structure that will ultimately hold thousands. What a modern marvel. As he finishes putting away his tools, he notices something. Through the still doorless frame, he sees someone walk by in the hallway. Normally, he wouldn't think anything of it. There's plenty of other people working on this floor of the hotel, but there's something about this woman. Could it be? No, it's not possible. He takes out his wallet and opens it. Inside is a faded photograph of the construction worker when he was still a young man, barely more than a boy, really. Standing next to him in the picture is the most beautiful woman he had ever known. She was his first true friend, his best friend, and he always hoped that maybe it would turn into something more. They grew up together, shared so many experiences, but then ultimately they were separated and lost touch. He was never able to find her again, but as the picture in his wallet shows, he never stopped thinking about her. Could it really be her, though? He runs into the hallway and calls out. The woman stops at the end of the hallway and turns around. She's carrying a tall stack of boxes that are blocking her face. She sets them down and he sees that it really is her. They run towards each other, laughing like children, like the way they used to, and embrace in the middle of the hall. He can't believe it. It's been so many years. He never thought he would see her again. How long has it been? Too long, she tells him. He can't believe how little she's changed. The years have hardly taken any toll on her. She's just as lovely and beautiful as that last day he saw her. He asks her where she's been, what she's been doing. Is she married? She tells him no, and that after they lost touch, she feels like she has just been looking for him, waiting for the day she would randomly see him pass by on the street so that they could reconnect. She just never thought it would happen that they'd be working in the same place at the same time. The construction worker can't believe it either. They both start to ask each other something at the same time, but then stop and laugh at speaking over each other. You go first, he tells her. No, you, she responds with a laugh. Just then, they're both interrupted by the sound of a whistle. The work is finished for the day. That's the signal to pack up and go home. The construction worker tells her to wait there. He just has to go grab his tools and then the two of them can go down together. But as he turns to leave, she reaches out and grabs his hand. Wait, she tells him. He stops and turns back to her. It's okay, he tells her. I'll be right back. But she doesn't seem to want to let go of his hand. Please, not yet, she tells him. I just want you to stay with me. He looks down mm -hmm. at his hand. She's gripping him so tight that it starts to hurt a little. Really, I'll just be a second, he tells her. Then we can go somewhere and catch up. But still, she won't let go of his hand. I need you, she tells him. She steps close to him, pressing her body against his. She closes her eyes and opens her mouth, and he feels himself doing the same. I've always needed you she says as their mouths are about to meet. I need you forever. The construction worker screams as the tiny tendrils emerge from the woman's body and plunge into his flesh. He opens his eyes to see the girl he once knew morphing into a writhing mass of fibers, each reaching out towards him. A long tentacle-like appendage wraps itself around his legs before whipping up and around his body, constraining him as a second tentacle wraps around his head, stifling his screams before popping his head off of his body. North Korea. It's a country that's shrouded in mystery, whose government, culture, and day-to-day -day life is a black box to many foreigners. But there's another secret inside, one that even the SCP Foundation is desperate to get to the bottom of, one that they know as SCP-031. SCP-031 is a massive organism, estimated to weigh more than 7,500 kilograms, that can currently be found in a very surprising location, the Ryugyong Hotel which is located in Pyongyang, the capital of Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The giant creature lives within the ductwork and maintenance infrastructure of the building, where it has spread to all 105 floors of the hotel. Each of its many tendrils ends in a pod-like growth called a sporocarp, which are approximately two meters in length and covered in many cilia-like structures. Subjects have reported that when in the presence of these sporocarp, they don't see them as the writhing mass of organic matter that they really are, but rather as an individual from their past, often with one whom they shared an intense emotional attachment. 
When taking this form, the sporocarp will try to convince the subject to remain with them for an extended period of time. The sporocarp will then attempt to make physical contact with the subject, and if successful, its cilia-like structures will begin injecting digestive juices directly into the subject. This will lead to the start of a process that will eventually cause their flesh to be broken down, consumed, and then incorporated into SCP-031's body mass. Unfortunately for the victim, this horrific process does not kill them. At the same time they are being digested, a flagellum, which is a tentacle-like appendage, will emerge from the sporocarp and wrap around the subject's head. This flagellum has its own set of tiny tendrils that penetrate the cranial cavity and replace the victim's brain's blood vessels, which has the effect of keeping the brain alive and functioning. The head is then removed from the body, and the brain is transported to the central mass of the SCP-031 organism, where it too is incorporated into the creature. It is estimated by Foundation researchers that SCP-031's mass contains thousands of such brains, and by all appearances, they are still alive and conscious. The Foundation first became aware of SCP-031 in 1948, following reports of police activity in North Korea at a location where multiple citizens had gathered near a refugee camp. Those gathered were proclaiming their love for a cult-like leader they referred to as the Beloved. The civilians were able to be calmed through the use of gas-based tranquilizers and amnestics by Mobile Task Force Psi-7, who then recovered a mass that would later be known as SCP-031 and secured it at a local containment site. The SCP-031 creature only weighed 75 kilograms at this time and still had a vaguely human shape. It did not seem to be able to incorporate other matter into its form at this point either, nor could it take on other people's forms, with its only anomalous effect seeming to be its ability to inspire intense feelings of love and devotion. The breakout of the Korean War in 1950 led to the destruction of the Foundation containment site, and all anomalies housed there escaped. Following the end of the war in 1953, all of the escaped anomalies were accounted for, all except SCP-031, which was presumed dead. Little more thought was given to the terminated anomaly until 1992, when the SCP Foundation caught wind of reports describing numerous fatalities involving workers at the Ryugyong Hotel. A mobile task force was sent to the hotel to investigate further, but after none of the members returned from the mission, the hotel was locked down and all construction was halted until further notice. By 2008, the increased infestation of the still windowless hotel led to local officials starting construction again to finish the building's exterior and hopefully hide the presence of SCP-031 within, which led to the deaths of even more workers. It's estimated that at its peak infestation, more than 75% of the hotel's 3,000 rooms were infested by SCP-031, but reclamation efforts have been able to reduce that number substantially. Flame projecting equipment is able to destroy SCP-031 tendrils and sporocarps, as well as any personnel who have become assimilated into SCP-031. Reclamation efforts are ongoing, and local officials continue to work with the SCP Foundation to facilitate the ultimate containment or neutralization of the entity. But there's one more strange twist to this story. The more astute SCP experts may have noticed the similarities to SCP-1427, a large slab of beryllium bronze with mind-altering effects that is also located within the Ryugyong Hotel. How is it that two anomalies, both of which strongly impact the human brain, are both somehow housed at the same location? Some clues exist in the form of a classified communication chain between two senior members of Foundation staff. The two discuss the obvious discrepancies that exist when there are records of two anomalies both existing at the same place at the same time, with neither file referencing the other. It leads to a strange paradox where for one to exist, the other isn't able to, and yet they both do exist. Teams sent to investigate SCP-1427 will find SCP-1427, and teams sent to investigate SCP-031 will find SCP-031. And yet the first team will have no memory of seeing SCP-031 and vice versa. When the teams were sent at the same time, they were unable to find each other, as if they were existing in parallel dimensions, each with its own version of the Ryugyong Hotel housing its own version of an SCP classified anomaly. Do both anomalies exist? Or perhaps neither of them do? Are both SCPs in fact the result of a third, as yet unknown anomaly? The answer to that question remains unknown, at least to the two senior members of the staff who were communicating about the contradictory files. Both were relieved of their duties under well, suspicious circumstances, and for the time being, both files continue to exist in the database, just as both anomalies seem to exist in the Ryugyong Hotel.
For now, this Euclid-class anomaly continues to be contained as well as it can be within the ducts and maintenance shafts of the hotel's central spire. The three secondary spires each contain a Type 9 Heaven's Blade restriction system that focuses a disruptive energy field towards the central spire. This system prevents SCP-031 psychic energies from escaping the structure and affecting any off-site personnel. As North Korean teams continue to push back against the spreading tendrils in the hopes that one day, they will finally be able to open the hotel. The homeless man in the alley looks down at his arm, wide-eyed in horror. Is his skin… moving? It almost seems to bubble, like water coming to a boil. He is experiencing a kind of pain he can't even imagine. He can feel something moving up against his bones, chewing through the calcium. He can't move. They're everywhere inside him, just eating. He opens his mouth to scream, but they've already chewed too many holes through his lungs for him to make a sound. Within the hour, he will be dead. But what's killing him? The store owner pulls a gleaming, serrated edge knife from the knife block, and with deft, practiced hands, he slices a delicious ciabatta roll in two. From there, he butters the bread, slices a juicy pair of New York steaks into thick, medium-rare chunks, adds in some diced vegetables and lettuce leaves, sprinkles on just a pinch of lime zest, and hey presto, he's got a delectable Caribbean-style pork sandwich. It's a thing of beauty. But he can't help but feel it's missing something. Oh, that's it. The thought hits him like a lightning bolt. This sandwich would be delicious, but it'd also be far too dry. How could he have made such a rookie mistake? He saunters across the kitchen and reaches into one of the many luxuriously appointed cabinets, feeling around for one of the many jars of mayonnaise he's got stowed away in there. He twists off the cap with a pleasing pop and spreads a little mayo onto the sandwich. It looks positively delicious, and he wastes no time in placing it pride of place in the display case. Everything is moving along perfectly. Boston is a foodie town. That's what the store owner tells himself as he flips around the sign on the door from closed to open for the very first time. After years working as a chef in other people's restaurants, the store owner has racked up the experience to strike out on his own and achieve his dream a boutique sandwich store on the Boston waterfront, where tourists from hither and yarn would be able to enjoy artisanal sandwiches while browsing the city's many historic locales. His employees are busying themselves around the store. They're all people he personally interviewed and selected. They all aligned with his mission and had a passion for sandwiches. One wipes down the tables in prep for the inevitable rush of customers when it turns lunchtime. Another is artfully posing a selection of pre-made sandwiches behind a sheet of glass at the counter. Leg ham and strong cheese, BLT, tuna mayo, and, of course, lobster. We can't forget that this is Boston, after all. But as the hours creep on, something horrible happens. Nobody shows up. The store owner doesn't know what he's done wrong. He managed to pay for an ad about the grand opening in one of the local papers and released some coupons in a local food magazine, too. He even put a grand opening sign and garland in the window, showing off the grand opening discount. For every sandwich a customer buys, they'll get another half off. But it seems that none of this conventional business wisdom actually shook out. His optimism wanes as the course of the day passes, and though they're all keeping up brave faces, he can see the doubt in the eyes of his employees, too. All of their minds are bubbling with the same terrifying thought, too awful to ever be spoken aloud. This whole thing has been a complete bust. When closing time comes, the store owner gathers his employees together to give him a pep talk, hoping to assuage all their fears about potentially losing their new jobs the same week they got them. He gives an inspiring speech about the importance of perseverance and grit and sticking to their dreams, despite the fact that there may be discouraging setbacks along the way. As he listens to himself talking, it occurs to him that these are the words he needs to hear as much as they are the words he needs to say. But after they've all gone home, he's left alone looking at the uneaten sandwiches in the display case. The anxiety of the day has killed any hope of his appetite, and then it dawns on him. Those sandwiches are going to be stale by tomorrow. All his hard work, all his passion, and he's going to need to throw them out. He takes the Caribbean pork sandwich first and morosely exit out of the back door. He sees the dumpster around the back of the building, but he also sees something else. A homeless man, looking cold and hungry, wrapped in dirty sheets deep in the alley. And in that moment, he has an idea. Perhaps he can still serve a hungry person today. The store owner offers his precious sandwich to the homeless man, who gratefully accepts, deciding it would be a terrible waste to just 
throw food away while there was a man going hungry behind his building, he gives all the sandwiches from the display case to the homeless man, who acts like it's the first time someone has been kind to him in many, many years. He eats every single sandwich and tells the store owner that it's one of the tastiest meals he's ever had. Clearly, when it comes to making sandwiches, the store owner has a gift. In one moment, he's reminded of why he does this, making people happy with food. He has no idea that, in a sense, he's just murdered the man who rekindled his passion. The next day, things change for the better. With renewed passion and vigor for the art of making and selling delicious sandwiches to tourists and the Boston public, he puts his all into the sandwich business, and Lady Luck responds. A few customers each day at first, and then the place becomes a local curiosity, the subject of online write-ups and must-visit-in-Boston lists. There are familiar faces that he sees every single day, and it's only a matter of weeks until he needs to start implementing a waiting list for customers. Business is booming, and despite his sudden and miraculous success, the store owner never forgets what sparked his second wind. He owes it all to the homeless man out behind the store, who reminded him of his true purpose. One day, he decides he needs to repay his old friend. He whips up a delicious tuna mayo sub and steps outside to give it to the homeless man. But the man is gone. It's strange. He's left some crumpled clothes behind and the piece of cardboard he'd always sleep on. But the man is gone. The store owner steps forward, concerned for the man's safety. It had been a particularly cold and unforgiving winter after all. But he sees something instead that utterly disgusts him. In amongst the scattered clothes, there's a worm-like creature, glistening white and about a foot long. It lays there in the pile of clothes, mercifully dead. But the mere sight of it so revolts the store owner that he drops the tuna mayo sub onto the ground, splattering it across the asphalt. It's a terrible waste of food, but after seeing that disgusting worm thing, he doesn't have any kind of appetite for the rest of the day. If that's as terrible as this whole thing got, it would have been bad enough. But the floodgates of terror are about to open, and when it does, only a certain organization has the tools to close it. The store owner starts noticing strange things at work after that. Something about the regulars. Some of them seem kind of strange and doughy. They've got pallid skin and a vacant look behind their eyes. Some of them who've ordered the same sandwich day after day, who've memorized the menus by heart, are taking full minutes to decide what they want to order, as though the workings of their very minds have been gummed up. As disturbing as these strange little signs are, they're nothing compared to the nightmarish things a number of Boston EMTs and emergency room doctors were encountering around that same time. People collapsing in their homes in a state of extreme pain, their panicked friends and spouses calling in, crying and unable to explain what's happening to their formerly healthy loved ones. This, of course, would be disturbing enough, but what happens to these people after being taken in takes it to a whole other level. In every single case, the technicians see something moving under their skin. They take x-rays, ultrasounds, or in some cases, even make incisions, and the result is always the same. The bodies of the people experiencing these symptoms are full of thousands upon thousands of white worms eating their innards from within, slowly killing them in perhaps the most painful way imaginable. Even seasoned doctors are passing out from sheer horror when they see the masses of impossible white parasites wriggling within their patients. The one piece of vital information they don't have is that all these victims had recently eaten at a certain up-and-coming sandwich store on the Boston Harbor. After 10 weeks of business, things are starting to cool down again for the sandwich store. The owner thinks that's to be expected. That opening FOMO hype can't go on forever. But the mysterious absence of some of his most loyal repeat customers is undeniably a little disturbing to him. Is it something he did wrong? Did he somehow alienate them? These thoughts are plaguing his mind when he's alone in the store one evening, cleaning up after everyone else has gone home. His thoughts are so occupied that, as he's preparing to screw the top back onto a jar of mayonnaise, he accidentally drops it. The jar stays intact, but a large, disgusting blob of mayo splatters out onto the floor. Ah, great, now he has to clean that up. He picks up the jar and takes it into the back alley, where he intends to throw it into the dumpster. With half of it spilled out onto the ground, it's too much of a hygiene risk for him to keep it in the restaurant anymore. But before he can throw it into the trash, his arm freezes in a moment of inexplicable hesitation. In that strange moment, it occurs to him that it's the only one in the cabinet of that particular brand. He's used it on so many sandwiches before, and yet he's never needed to buy a new jar of it either. 
On a pure whim, he decides to inspect it closer. The label on the back of the jar reads, Water, vegetable oil, vinegar, eggs, 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 eat eggs, be eggs. Your flesh is but the nursery and sustenance of our incalculable ravenous mouths. Eat eggs, consume us, let us be realized within you. Sugar, salt, lemon juice, and love. Oh, he thinks to himself, that isn't good. Without a second's delay, he runs back into the sandwich store, wondering with horror just what exactly he'd been feeding his customers all this time. But these thoughts are interrupted when he sees that the mess of mayonnaise is somehow gone from the floor. He didn't clean it up, did he? Something is terribly wrong here. That's the only thing he knows for certain. He may not even be safe in here. He lunges out and grabs a frying pan, the one he uses to sizzle up the steak for the store's famous Boston-style cheesesteak sandwiches, and assumes a defensive position. His instincts might just save his life here, as something watches him from the shadows. Without warning, something comes squealing towards him, about the size of a rat with shiny, smooth, white skin propelling itself along the ground on a collection of horrid little tendrils. It makes a horrific shrieking sound and lunges for him. Almost instinctually, he whacks it with his frying pan, sending it flying across the kitchen, where it lands against the wall with a splat. Did… did he just get attacked by a living blob of mayonnaise? Before he can even contemplate all the implications of that, he sees the splat slithering down the wall and gathering in a puddle on the floor. This puddle then twists and warps, taking the exact same horrible shape it had before. Tendrils sliding out of its shimmering skin. It must have formed out of the contents of almost the entire mysterious jar. And it dawns on him all at once, in every single sandwich his shop had served which contained mayonnaise, he's been putting these little monsters into people's bodies. And as the beast shakes off the shock and prepares to charge again, he's starting to worry that he might be in for the same fate. Only in Boston, right? Whether you love or despise mayonnaise, it's likely that SCP-2484, aptly titled The Parasitic Mayonnaise Worms, made you feel a little queasy. But if you're anything like the Foundation field agents who first discovered this caustic condiment, you likely have some pressing questions about what exactly you just witnessed. Thanks to my research into a number of classified files, I'm able to give you the answers, but I'm afraid I can't tell you that it won't get any less repulsive. To the untrained eye, SCP-2484 is a mayonnaise jar of indeterminate brand containing approximately 1,024 grams of a substance that, to all chemical tests, seems to be identical to regular mayonnaise. This substance, for the sake of avoiding confusion, will be referred to as SCP-2484-A. While inside the jar, SCP-2484-A poses no threat to anyone. But the second the anomalous mayonnaise leaves the jar or is consumed by a vertebrate animal, the disturbing effects you've already witnessed take hold. The jar contains an infinite quantity of this mayonnaise too. When the contents of SCP-2484 are removed, it will begin to refill by 2 milliliters every hour. Luckily for the Foundation's biohazard control units, SCP-2484-A can be destroyed in any manner that non-anomalous mayonnaise can be destroyed. Personally, I've never contemplated ways of destroying mayonnaise, so I'll leave the devising of these methods to greater minds than my own. Any quantity of SCP-2484-A less than 5 grams doesn't seem to display any anomalous properties, so if you're content with a tiny quantity of mayo on your food, you may encounter this anomaly and live to tell the tale. But masses between 5 grams and 63 grams are another story. These masses will develop a repulsive, congealed membrane, a kind of smooth, glossy skin over their body, as well as crude, tentacle-like pseudopods. These creatures will slither and crawl around without any real direction. These won't pose any threat to other organisms, so long as they don't touch or ingest them. If only the same could be said for the larger ones. Slightly larger creatures formed out of SCP-2484-A, specifically ones weighing between 63 grams and 235 grams, will move with more direction and purpose. They will seek out solid foods and potable liquids, diffusing themselves into them and infecting them with their secondary anomalous quality, which we'll discuss shortly. Needless to say, one should avoid consuming food infected in this manner at all costs. Masses of SCP-2484-A ranging from 235 grams to 804 grams take a more direct and aggressive route to infecting their hosts. 
They will use their pseudopods to actively seek out vertebrate animals and try to enter their body through any means necessary. From all major bodily orifices and even more novel methods of intrusion, such as pores and open wounds. But this is nothing compared to the danger presented by masses of SCP-2484-A, ranging from 804 grams to 1,024 grams. These creatures are highly violent and aggressive, stopping at nothing to attack and enter vertebrate animals, going as far as forcing themselves through the victim's skin. It goes without saying that these are the most dangerous types to encounter of any of them, and you may need to brush up on your methods of destroying mayonnaise that we mentioned earlier in order to survive. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that your greatest anti-mayonnaise contingency plans have failed. The anomalous SCP-2484-A mayonnaise has entered your body in a dangerous quantity, which is to say, 3 grams per every kilogram of body weight. If this describes your experience, then you're about to undergo the secondary effects of this anomaly, which I'm sorry to tell you are even more unpleasant than the primary effects. At first, the effects will appear to be relatively benign, including higher blood sugar levels, increased heart rate, slower cognition, and higher body heat. Not dissimilar to the effects of consuming a large quantity of non-anomalous mayonnaise. Within the body, however, things will be taking a considerably more drastic turn. The SCP-2484-A in the victim's body will begin to turn into small, gamete-like cells through some kind of anomalous force of metabolization. Then things will accelerate considerably. Within three to six hours, the cells will develop into tiny nematodes around a millimeter in length that begin swimming through the body. A single gram of SCP-2484-A can become around 500 of these parasitic nematodes. If that's already making your skin itch, it's going to get an awful lot worse from there. Between 5 and 40 hours after SCP-2484-A infects its hosts, whether through consumption or forceful entry, the parasitic nematodes will begin eating the host's tissues, giving them the mass to grow up to 12 centimeters long, at which point the host is likely to experience horrific pain as they're eaten from within. When the host has been entirely devoured, the parasitic mayonnaise worms will turn on each other and start eating. After all this, only one worm will be left, measuring from 20 to 30 centimeters in length. It will then enter a dormant state and die within four days. As obligate parasites, the creatures spawned by SCP-2484-A are not designed to survive outside the host body after they've developed. Any worms removed from the victim's body will die within five hours, but no attempts thus far to save anyone infected with SCP-2484-A have been successful. Infection is, sadly, invariably lethal. Our opening tale was also the first recorded case study of SCP-2484 encountered by Foundation field agents. The source was an independent sandwich store in Boston, Massachusetts, triangulated after a series of reports of strange parasite behavior over a 10-week period. The SCP-2484 jar had been in the store's refrigerator with a number of non-anomalous mayonnaise jars, though the store's owner, when questioned by Foundation operatives, could not remember ever having bought this particular jar of mayo. How it made its way into the store is, to this day, a mystery. Once the Foundation had contained the threat, all surviving sandwich store employees were given amnestics, along with a number of medical personnel who'd also encountered the parasites. All the hosts were, of course, lost. SCP-2484 is currently classified as safe. It is kept in a standard refrigerated perishables unit, essentially a kind of high-security fridge. No more than 400 grams of the anomalous mayonnaise is allowed to be removed for experimentation at any time, and no destructive tests are authorized at this time. Any personnel hoping to access SCP-2484 need to have Level 3 access clearance or above. Condiments can be a loaded issue. I've personally witnessed arguments on the merits of ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise that have reached greater intensity than some Keter-class containment breaches, but I'd advise you to exercise caution. Next time you make yourself a delicious BLT and you're preparing to spread some mayo across the bread, or you're wondering which flavor will perfectly accompany your next hot dog, take a second to think. You may not know what you're really putting into your body. The old married couple is hiding, terrified, under their bed and a hand reaches underneath, grabbing for them. In the intruder's other hand, the silvery glint of a knife. It looks like this is curtains for them. It's just a little bit after 8 p.m., and the old woman has just finished brewing a pot of fresh coffee, filling the kitchen with its warm, rich aroma. Most people associate coffee with mornings, with breakfast and newspaper. 
a hurried bite of toast on the way out the door to work or school. But she prefers to prepare her coffee in the evenings, just as darkness and quiet have settled over her neighborhood and wrapped the house in a cozy blanket of night. She pours two cups, watching the steam curl up into the air, and carries them into the living room, where her husband is waiting for her on the couch. It's a familiar ritual, one they've repeated most nights together since their daughter left for college so many years ago. It may seem simple, but it's part of a collage of little, simple things that make their house into a home. Home has meant a lot of different things to the two of them over the years. Nervousness and possibility when they first married and bought the house. Chaos and joy when their daughter was born, ripping through the structure of their lives like a tiny, lovable tornado. And now, contentment, peace, safety. Throughout it all, home has been a sanctuary. And as they sit together on the couch, flipping through the TV channels and sipping their twin cups of coffee, it never crosses their minds for a moment that this sanctuary might be invaded. They certainly don't look over their shoulders at the dark shadow in the window, the silhouette of someone standing there between the bushes, watching them, waiting. The couple doesn't even have an inkling that something is wrong until they hear a soft rattling sound coming from the front door. Is someone there? When they turn, they don't see anyone outside, can't see who might have been jiggling the knob. How strange. They must have heard wrong. Or whoever was there must have realized they had the wrong place. They turn their attention back to the TV, back to their coffee. They don't see the same shadowy figure scuttle up the wall outside, creeping up onto the roof. They hear it, though. The uneasy thump of something heavy settling onto the tiles up there. Someone walking where they shouldn't. The couple freezes, staring up at the ceiling, listening to be certain they didn't miss here. There it is again, the unmistakable drag of footsteps. The husband sets his coffee cup down, his face settling into a determined grimace. He has a baseball bat in the hall closet. Now seems like a good time to grab it. His wife isn't about to let him handle the situation by himself. She grabs the half-full coffee pot from the kitchen, still piping hot. It isn't much, but she hopes it will be able to do some damage in a pinch. They're both so preoccupied with arming themselves for the potential confrontation that they don't notice that the footsteps on the roof have gone silent. They don't stop to ask themselves a very important question, one that the citizens of this famously safe neighborhood rarely ever do. Did they lock the back door? The unasked question gets its answer in the form of a slow, nauseating creak of a door inching open, letting in the cool night air and a stranger in a black hood. The couple reconvene in their living room with their makeshift weapons, in time to watch the shadowy figure stalk in front of the kitchen, their wide eyes locking on the menacing glint of the kitchen knife in the intruder's hand. The intruder lurches toward the wife, and in a flurry of panic, she throws the coffee pot, splashing hot liquid all over the stranger and knocking them in the head with the pot. They don't do so much as flinch, continuing to advance toward the couple, brandishing the knife. The man raises the bat, preparing to swing it as hard as he can but just as he's about to, he falters. The bat drops from his hands, clattering to the floor. He gapes at the stranger in utter horror, as if he's just seen his worst nightmare realized. He stands there, frozen to the spot, eyes filling with tears, as the stranger pulls back their arm, knife's point trained on his chest. His wife leaps into action, grabbing his arm and yanking him back. She wants to ask him what on earth made him stop cold like that, but she'll have to wait until they're both safe again. In all the commotion, the intruder managed to place himself between the couple and the front door, so the wife looks for a better option. The closest way out of immediate danger is up the stairs, so she tugs her husband's arm so hard she worries it might dislocate and leads them both up to their bedroom. She slams the door shut behind them, locking it, and jams a chair up under the handle for good measure. With a moment to catch her breath, she turns to her husband and asks what he saw that shook him so deeply. He shakes his head, struggling to speak. He manages to get the words out. The attacker, the person who broke into their house and came at them with a knife, is someone they know. Not a neighbor, not a disgruntled co-worker, but their own flesh and blood. It's their daughter. At first, she doesn't believe him. That can't possibly be true. But the look in his eyes convinces her that he's telling the truth. She doesn't have a chance to ask any of the questions she wants to because the doorknob begins to rattle. With nowhere else to run save for a window that's much too high to jump from, they have no other choice but to hide. The wife quickly opens the window, hoping to convince the intruder, her daughter, 
that they decided to risk the fall and jump. Then she and her husband slide under the bed and hold their breath. For a seemingly endless moment, the only sound is the rattle of the doorknob and the pounding of their pulses in their ears. Then, with a sudden burst of shocking, seemingly impossible strength, the intruder splinters the door into pieces. They watch helplessly, covering their mouths to keep from making a sound as a pair of black boots walk into the room, stalking through it, searching for them. The footsteps make their way over to the window as the intruder notices that it's open. Did it work? Are they safe? It's beginning to look like they just might be. But then a hand reaches beneath the bed, grabbing the husband by his shirt and yanking him out from under the bed. He screams as the intruder raises the knife, and a spray of blood stains the wallpaper red as the knife finds its target. The wife scrambles out from under the bed, making a break for the window, ready to risk the fall if it means survival. But a hand grips her shoulder, hard enough to bruise, and drags her back into the room. The only thing she sees is the knife, slick with her husband's blood, and beneath the black hood of a cloak, the expressionless face of her own daughter. By the time the police arrive on the scene, the killer is long gone. All they find is a terrible scene, a broken door, two bodies, and danger invading a peaceful town. This isn't the first call they've gotten about a home invasion this month either. All over town, five different families have been terrorized and murdered, and every time, the perpetrator escapes the scene before the authorities can arrive. This is the sixth, just the latest in the line of horrible mysteries. Meanwhile, a woman walks down a side street, casually stripping off her bloodied cloak and tossing it into a dumpster. Beneath it, she is dressed in plain black clothes with one curious accessory, an iron collar. She stops suddenly, just outside of a dilapidated old house. In the practiced manner of someone who has been there before, she walks around to the side of the house, then tugs open the rusted storm cellar door. She climbs down into the darkness and disappears inside. Once the woman has entered the basement, she is met with the glow of flickering candles dripping red wax onto the floor. Their eerie light illuminates the dusty room and the menacing sights within. There are six people waiting for her there, standing in a circle, all wearing dark robes. Five of them have matching collars around their necks, the same as hers. At the center of the circle, standing before a pile of bloody knives, is a man holding a rectangular remote control. His face is friendly, plain, almost aggressively ordinary, but his eyes are dark and cold, ringed with dark circles from an untold number of sleepless nights. The floor is smeared with arcane symbols painted in blood, littered with the bones of animals. The whole room reeks of iron and rotting flesh. Still, the woman does not react, her eyes as dispassionate as they were when she butchered her parents only a little while ago. As the man with the remote control, the leader, presses a series of buttons, the woman takes her place in the circle, tossing her freshly bloodied knife onto the pile. He smiles at her, a broad, warm, beatific smile, like an owner celebrating their new puppy performing a trick for the very first time. He congratulates her on a job well done, then hits another button on the remote, placing her in a static position, arms at her sides. He addresses his group of acolytes, holding his arms up to command the attention of the room. Not that he needs to do much to command their attention. Their eyes are trained on him, unblinking. Their expressions vary, however. Some look unfazed, like the woman who entered the room most recently. Others stare at him in awe, some with an undercurrent of fear, and others gaze at him with pure, naked hatred. Still, they do not move. It is, the leader announces, time for the next phase of their transition into their new lives. Now that they have all eliminated their families and nothing ties them to their lives before they found him, they are prepared to sever all connection to their former selves. They've quit their jobs, abandoned their relationships, and eliminated their blood ties. And now it is time for them to shed their previous physical forms. It is time to evolve. He points to one of the more eager acolytes, calling them forward. It's a young man, no more than 21, a college student most likely. He should be holed up in a library, cramming for his midterm exams. Instead, he's here, in this blood-streaked basement, eagerly approaching the man with the remote and kneeling at his feet. The man doesn't even need to control this one's movements with the remote anymore, but still he raises it and presses a new series of buttons, 
one the Acolytes have never seen him use before. All of a sudden, the young man's back arches at a disturbingly sharp angle, an angle that should be impossible without snapping his spine. His eyes roll back in his head until only the whites are showing. His lips curl back from his teeth in an expression caught somewhere between a snarl, a smile, and a scream. The leader hits another button, and the young man's eyes begin to widen. It isn't just that his eyelids are opening further to reveal more of his eyes, but the sockets themselves are widening, the eyeballs expanding to fill the additional space. His arms begin to stretch at the same time, forearms extending longer and longer, until his arms are as long as his legs. His fingers extend in the same way, growing additional knuckles as they do, bending in so many more places than ordinary human fingers should. As the acolytes watch the transformation, the woman who killed her parents earlier tonight becomes aware of a sudden sensation, one she hasn't felt in months. At her sides, her fingers begin to twitch. She swallows a lump in her throat. Her eyes sting with tears. She can move on her own again, and she is terrified. The reality of what she has done crashes over her in a wave of grief, regret, and rage. He made her do it, but now... With the power of the remote focused on reshaping the young man in the center of the circle, she is tasting a moment of freedom. The leader hasn't noticed yet. She just has to decide what to do with it. As the leader punches another button, twisting the young acolyte's feet around until they point backward, tendons popping and bones snapping loud enough to fill the room with a cacophony of horror, the woman's eyes settle on the remote in the leader's hand. That damned thing. It's the cause of all of this. It's the reason she's standing here, and the two people she loved more than anything in the world are lying dead on their bedroom floor. It and him. The leader. She doesn't even know his name, but she does know one thing for certain. She's going to kill him tonight. With the feral determination of someone with nothing left to live for, the woman leaps at the leader, knocking him to the ground and knocking the remote out of his hand. He roars with rage at this interruption, at this show of defiance from one of his acolytes, and scrambles to grab it off of the ground, but she gets there first. She doesn't know how to operate it, but she presses buttons at random, hoping to free the others. All around the circle, the acolytes' limbs begin to jerk wildly, their feet moving of their own volition. Some of them are screaming, some laughing, some weeping. The transformed young man on the floor hisses and grabs at the woman, clawing at her hand, and trying to rip the remote from her grasp. As she smashes as many buttons as she can, the leader picks up one of the knives from the floor and charges at her, the room plunging into a chaotic blur of violence and fear. When the police burst into the house the next day, when they discover the secrets in the basement, everyone in it is dead. The unusual circumstances of the case attract the attention of the SCP Foundation, who take over the investigation and bring the strange items at the scene into custody, giving them the official designation SCP-010. SCP-010 consists of six visually identical cast iron collars, each equipped with a numbered metal tag, as well as one remote control that appears to go with all of the collars. The collars have been designated SCP-010-2 through 010-7. Each collar contains intricate electronic components and is powered by small rechargeable 100-volt batteries. The remote is a heavy black box that resembles an old-fashioned handheld radio transmitter receiver with a primitive blue-white cathode ray screen and over 100 buttons, in addition to a frequency tuner. These buttons are all unlabeled. Through a great deal of trial and error, the Foundation research team was able to identify the frequencies of all six collars. The metal is stamped with a label in Russian, as well as a logo that resembles workers building a pyramid. If one of the collars is placed around a person's neck and secured, and the remote is tuned to the corresponding frequency, the user will be able to use the remote to control their every movement. In addition to their movements, the remote can also control their adrenal response, as well as the sympathetic nervous system, which helps to activate the body's fight or flight response to stress. The remote is able to activate or deactivate this system, causing the person to experience extreme stress or preventing them from experiencing this response even when the stimulus they are exposed to would normally cause it. The most unusual and unexpected feature of these already unusual collars is their ability to affect the physical morphology of the person wearing them. The extent of these potential changes has yet to be measured, but seems as if it would be nearly limitless for someone with complete command of the remote's programming language. 
SCP-010 was first discovered in the basement of a man in the Midwestern United States after being connected to a local missing persons case. When the police raided his house, they found the bodies of several missing persons, as well as the man himself. They also found signs of a struggle and SCP-010's remote and collars. After the SCP Foundation got their hands on SCP-010, they conducted an experiment in the hope of better understanding its functionality. Researchers took SCP-010-2 apart piece by piece, labeling each component and photographing it. After it was reassembled, SCP-010-2 resumed functioning as normal. With a new understanding of the parts that make up these collars, the researchers attempted to build one of their own from scratch, creating the closest approximation possible of its components. Some were impossible to replicate, but the team did their best. In spite of their efforts, the new collar, SCP-010-8, did not function. However, when the unreplicable components of SCP-010-2 were removed and placed into SCP-010-8, it began to function as intended. Of course, this came at the cost of SCP-010-2's functionality, and it would not work again until its components were returned. For the next test, the replicable components in SCP-010-2 were replaced with replicas at random. When activated, SCP-010 was still able to function, and the swapping of replicable components did not affect functionality at all. All SCP-010 objects must be kept in numbered locked boxes at Site-19. They may not be worn by anyone except approved test subjects, and may only be removed from storage for testing. Any unauthorized use of SCP-010 is grounds for termination. When I most recently checked, one addendum had been added to the official file for SCP-010. An anonymous Foundation doctor wrote, SCP-010 has been demonstrated to work more effectively in creating unskilled labor than for any other task. The logo is apt. No further explanation of what that unskilled labor might be was included, and if there is one to be found, I don't have the clearance to access it. As far as anomalies go, I find SCP-010 to be uniquely disquieting. Free will is one of the most sacred things we have. It's the very essence of our humanity. Our ability to make our own choices, to govern our lives, to have ownership of our bodies and minds, this is something that should never be stripped away. I can't think of a greater violation than to be forced into one of these collars. My only comfort, and there is very little to be had as long as SCP-010 exists, is that there are only a few of these collars out there, and whatever makes the collars work, the Foundation currently has no way to recreate it. Though I'm sure this is frustrating for their researchers, I will personally sleep a little easier at night knowing they can't build as many of these collars as they want, creating an infinite army of powerless slaves. At least, they can't yet. The rattlesnake strikes, sinking its fangs through the furry carapace of the tarantula. It writhes briefly on the golden sands, then goes limp. The desert is a brutal place. Here, it's eat or be eaten. A man walks through a remote desert landscape, a pack on his back. The sun dips down over the horizon, a welcome reprieve from the heat, but bringing its own new threats. The dangers of the day may be gone for now, but the dangers of the night are just beginning. As he walks, he hears a strange sound behind him. He turns, and by the dim light of the moon, he sees a mound of sand advancing toward him, as if blown by a storm, but there's no wind blowing. Frightened, he tries to run, but the dune gains on him until he is completely submerged. After a moment, the sand disperses, revealing nothing left but a skeleton. The dune travels off into the distance, disappearing from view. The desert is an unforgiving place for a traveler. The days are hot and dry, baking you with the relentless heat of the sun. The nights are cold and just as inhospitable as the desert's wild inhabitants come out of hiding, ready to attack any perceived threats or invaders. The year is 1908, and a cavalry troop on their way back to base are getting a crash course in just how brutal the Arizona desert can be. The trip has taken longer than anticipated, and their horses are growing sluggish from thirst, trudging slower and slower through the dust and sand. The soldiers' eyes sting from the sun, the sweat, and the lack of proper sleep. They need a place to hang their hats for the night, to have a hearty meal and a tall glass of water, and maybe something stronger too after all this trouble. As if in answer to their prayers, the men suddenly spotted a faded sign for a town further down the road, only one mile left to Fredericksburg, it said. 
they would be able to reach the town by sundown, a welcome reprieve from sleeping on the ground and watching their supplies dwindle day by day. The mile seems to stretch on forever, but they persist and reach their oasis, the town of Fredericksburg. They aren't exactly expecting a welcome parade upon their arrival, but they're still shocked by how tepid a reception is waiting for them. Here they are, members of the army cavalry, and no one comes out to greet them, or even to see who the strange men in uniform on horses might be. As a matter of fact, the men don't see anyone at all, not one single soul. They stop in the middle of the town square, climbing down from their horses, and call out, shouting at the top of their lungs. Still, no doors fling open, no windows are cracked, and no one comes to see what all the commotion was. The only evidence that anyone was ever there at all is the buildings themselves, and a few handwritten signs posted throughout the area. The signs are all in German, and none of the soldiers can speak enough German to read them. If they could, they would probably leave the town as quickly as possible, hop on their horses and gallop away until it vanishes from view. But they can't, so they don't. One of the men suggests that the town is abandoned, that it's become a ghost town. The more they see of the town, the more they think he might be right. The buildings are still in good condition, but there's no one inside. It's as if the entire town got up one day and decided to leave it all behind. Then it sat untouched until the cavalry came. So one of the other men wonders, what should they do? The plan doesn't have to change, another one suggests. A night's sleep in an abandoned town is far better than another night of setting up camp and sleeping on the ground. Near the edge of town, they find a tavern and an adjoining hotel. There may not be any staff or other lodgers, but there's a stable for the horses, plenty of beds, and a few unopened bottles behind the bar. That's more than enough for the night. So they tie up the horses, have a few drinks, sing a few drinking songs, and settle in for what is sure to be the best sleep they've had in many, many days. They're so exhausted and so relieved to find shelter that they don't stop for one moment to wonder what might have caused the residents of Fredericksburg to abandon their homes all at once. Ghost towns don't come out of nowhere after all. Ghosts have to be made. But exhaustion is a powerful thing, and the allure of a soft, if dusty, bed is hard to resist when one's bones are aching and eyelids are growing heavy. So instead of asking questions, they sleep. A deep, blissfully ignorant sleep. A few hours later, one of the men suddenly wakes, jolted from slumber by a horrible high-pitched neigh. One neigh quickly becomes a chorus as more voices join in. The horses, something's wrong. He jumps out of bed and runs down to the stable, expecting to see a rattlesnake or a coyote, or perhaps a thief who snuck into town to loot the empty houses. What he finds is far more disturbing than he ever could have anticipated. The horses are in a state of sheer panic, stamping their hooves and tossing their heads back, eyes rolling wildly in their sockets. As he attempts to find the source of their terror, the man realizes that there are fewer horses in the stable than there were when the men went to bed. Did the others somehow escape? He turns to inspect the stable and sees seven piles of clean, white bones where there once were horses. One pile of bones for each missing horse. It's impossible, but he's looking at it with his own eyes. Something was in here with the horses. It attacked, and it devoured them whole and left only the bones behind. What sort of creature could have done this? None that he wants to meet, that's for sure. There isn't anything in the stable anymore, no threat that he can see. He needs to get back inside and warn the rest of the men before whatever did this decides to come back. The other soldiers aren't thrilled to be woken up in the middle of the night, and they're even less thrilled when they hear the wild story of what the man saw down there in the stable. But still they've never seen him so afraid. So they reluctantly pull themselves out of bed, and some of the less bleary-eyed men agree to join him in investigating the situation. While they head down to the stable to look for potential danger, the rest of the men roll back over in bed and close their eyes. No use losing sleep over a situation that's as good as handled. They'll take care of the snake or would-be thief or what have you, and come morning, it'll all be fine anyway. Down at the stable, the horses have calmed down, Whatever preyed on the seven horses reduced to bone, it's gone now. But even though the horses have stilled, the soldiers do not feel comforted. There's still the mystery of what could have done this. They were afraid of what they might find when they came down to investigate, but finding nothing is somehow worse. They were only asleep for a matter of hours before the horses started screaming. What manner of beast or man could have done away with seven horses in that time? 
there isn't an animal they can conceive of capable of feeding so efficiently. Sure, a wolf can kill quickly, but to kill seven times in a row without a sound, without a fight, and to clean the bones of any speck of meat all without being caught, it seems like the work of something beyond the natural world. One of the more superstitious soldiers, pale and trembling, suggests that the abandoned town must be haunted by a vengeful and hungry spirit. It demanded an offering in exchange for their trespassing here and took the horses as a sacrifice. The others laugh at him, but secretly, they're just as frightened as him. They're supposed to be brave in the face of the unknown, but it's the dead of night in a town with no people, and something is eating the horses. Meanwhile, back in the hotel, many of the other men struggle to get back to sleep. They're exhausted, the remnants of sleep still clouding their eyes and weighing down their heads, but the insistent, nervous pounding of their hearts is keeping them awake. They are suddenly acutely aware of the complete silence that surrounds them. In the dark, they can't hear anything but their own breathing, quick and shallow. Then, suddenly, another sound breaks through the quiet. It's a soft sound, like a tide rushing ashore. Sand on sand, the flow of something, a gentle, scraping sound. What is that? Could it be the wind? Doesn't sound like any wind they've ever heard. For one thing, it's coming from inside the building. For another, it's getting closer. One curious soldier climbs out of bed to seek out the source of the noise. He opens the door to his room, squinting to make out shapes among the shadows. At first, he thinks the motel must be flooding. Something's pouring into the hall, spilling across the floor and flowing closer and closer. But as it approaches, he sees that it isn't water at all. It's sand. He can't see where it's coming from or how it came into the building in the first place, but that doesn't matter. It's slowly filling the building, and more importantly, it seems to be headed straight for him. Instinctively, he jumps back into his room, slamming the door shut to block the flood of sand, but he didn't account for the crack under the door. And as he watches, the sand begins spilling into his room from beneath the door. It moves as if it were alive, creeping across the floor toward him. He scrambles backward, jumping onto the bed to avoid the tide of sand. Still, it advances closer and closer, piling up until it can reach him there. There's no doubt about it, this is no ordinary sand. It isn't just filling the room at the urging of gravity or some sort of indoor storm. It's deliberately creeping, advancing, hunting. He glances around the room, desperate for a means of escape, but there's nowhere to run. The only way out is the door, blocked by the ever-increasing tide of sand. It rises to the height of the bed, spilling onto the mattress and preparing to engulf him. He isn't certain what will happen to him when it does, but he's looked death in the face enough times to recognize it on sight. The sand is covering his feet now, climbing up his legs, ready to cover his body and swallow him whole. He opens his mouth to scream, and sand pours through his lips, filling his throat and lungs. He collapses onto the bed under the weight of the assault, and he disappears. One of the sleeping soldiers wakes to the sound of a scream from the next room. He goes to sit up, but finds his arm is strangely heavy. He looks over and is shocked to see that his arm is covered with sand. And the sand is moving, undulating on his arm like a swarm of tiny creatures. He tries to shake them loose, but for some reason, his arm feels paralyzed. With his other hand, he swipes at the sand, brushing it away as quickly as possible to reveal the arm beneath. When he can see it, he wishes he couldn't. Bone, a skeleton hand poking from beneath the sleeve of his nightshirt. He flies into a blind panic, stumbling out of bed, his bone arm dangling useless at his side, and fumbles with the doorknob, desperate to escape. But the sand is relentless, already swarming around his feet and weighing him down. Before he can take a single step out of the room, the swarm of sand overtakes him, and he is buried in a living grave. Throughout the hotel, once thought to be abandoned, but now clearly occupied by something hungry, the men flee their rooms, abandoning belongings to the flood of sand. As they run, they see more and more sand pouring into the walls like waves and waves of water ready to drown them. They pull on their boots to protect their bare feet and sprint as fast as their legs will carry them, jumping and weaving around the piles of sand to avoid being eaten until they make it outside. There, the other men have begun to prepare the horses, the horrified screams from inside having served as a pretty clear indication that it is time to take their leave. As they mount their horses and prepare to flee, they realize that four men are missing from their ranks. 
One soldier suggests that they run back inside, perform a rescue mission, and try to recover the missing four. But it is obvious that no one wants to step foot back into that sandy den of death. They don't want to leave any men behind, but the choice is between four men and all of them. The sight of another wave of sand pouring through the hotel's door makes up their minds for them, and they climb onto their horses, some riding two men to one horse, and gallop out of Fredericksburg into the night. The four men lost to the sands will never be seen again, joining the rest of Fredericksburg's ghosts. Though it wouldn't be classified for many more years, these unfortunate men had encountered the deadly appetite of SCP-165. SCP-165's organic component resembles a typical parasitic mite, each instance of which is 750 micrometers in length, with eight legs and a genetic structure similar to that of a house dust mite. The main difference between these organisms and the dust mites they resemble is their hermit crab-like tendency to attach grains of sand to their backs for an as-of-yet unknown purpose. The creatures travel as a colony, numbering in the hundreds of billions or even trillions, giving the appearance of a large dune of sand. In spite of their tendency to move as a pack, SCP-165 instances do not cooperate with one another. Instead, they act in competition with each other, fighting over food with an insatiable appetite. Much like mosquitoes, these mites detect their prey by sensing carbon dioxide and sugars in the air. Once this prey has been sniffed out, the mites will use their legs to climb over each other, rolling toward their target until they have enveloped it. The bite of SCP-165 releases a numbing chemical toxin, similar to the toxins found in mosquito and flea bites. The subject will be unable to tell that millions of mites are biting at their flesh until it is far too late, the swarm stripping them down to the bone in minutes. This numbing effect works so well that some victims have been completely devoured in their sleep without ever once waking up. The SCP-165 mites are nearly invulnerable, resistant to all but the deadliest pesticides. They do, however, avoid heat, seeking shade whenever available and being the most active at night. They show a preference for large, sleeping prey. This dislike for heat and apparent vulnerability to it is the most useful method for containing the mites. While investigating the initial discovery of SCP-165 by the SCP Foundation, I discovered an addendum to the official file. Though some portions had been redacted for, I presume, security purposes, I was able to piece together the most relevant information. From what I can surmise, the United States government has been aware of the existence of SCP-165 for at least 80 years. The mites were first discovered in Fredericksburg, Arizona, a forgotten town formerly populated largely by German immigrants. This town is also, I must note, located in the Thule Desert near the Goldwater Air Force bombing range. Fredericksburg was founded in the late 1800s, and by 1908, it had become a ghost town. Its sudden, strange emptiness was discovered by a passing cavalry troop, who quickly discovered that there was a reason for the disappearance of Fredericksburg's inhabitants. This much I essentially already knew. What I didn't know, however, is that the United States government attempted to exterminate SCP-165 in the late 1950s. In fact, this goal is attributed to the creation of a bombing range in the area, though I was unable to officially confirm this. The bombing range and its subsequent use was able to successfully reduce the population of SCP-165. However, the explosives were insufficient to completely eradicate the threat. So, in the late 1980s, the SCP Foundation opted to intervene and deploy a ground cleanup and extraction team. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-9, aka Fire Eaters, was dispatched to Fredericksburg to extract and contain SCP-165 by any means necessary. Upon entering the decrepit town, the task force was met with an ominous sight. Vacant buildings lined the streets, left in disrepair but otherwise untouched. The only sign that life was ever there at all was the bones, animal and human alike, littering the dusty ground. One MTF member spotted a sign, hand-lettered in German, reading, Vorsicht vor dem Krieg in den hungrigen Sand. Though he didn't speak German, one of his fellow task force members did, and translated it for the others. Beware the creeping, hungry sands. With this ominous warning in mind, MTF Epsilon 9 advanced into a nearby house to investigate. There, they found the floors completely covered with mounds of sand. The untrained eye might just assume that this was ordinary sand, but the task force knew better. These were instances of SCP-165 hiding from the heat and sunlight beneath the shelter of this roof. 
At the first sign of movement, their suspicions were confirmed, and the MTF members produced their flamethrowers, assaulting SCP-165 with blasts of fire until the movement ceased. These measures proved highly successful, melting the sand to glass and repelling whatever mites were not trapped inside. A living dune made up of four metric tons of SCP-165 was contained and transported to ABC Area 14. SCP-165 is contained in a facility at Armed Biocontainment Area 14. SCP-165 is considered to be a contagious, pathological organism, and so containing it requires the highest sterilization and quarantine procedures to be followed. There are microwave field generators placed around SCP-165's containment area in order to restrict the movement of the dune. Once every nine days, the mass of SCP-165 is to be fed at least 750 kilograms of live cattle. Attempts to feed the entities via pre-slaughtered food sources have proven ineffective. For whatever reason, they prefer live prey. Unfortunate for the cows, but the Ethics Committee has proposed that they be sedated prior to feeding time in order to minimize potential suffering. We tend to associate sand with discomfort, whether it's intruding on a day at the beach and wedging itself into the most inconvenient crevices, or sticking to anything and everything placed in its vicinity. As someone once said, it's coarse, it's rough, and it gets everywhere. But if SCP-165 ever breaks containment and spreads to other parts of the country, or even the world, it could do much more harm than some simple irritation. That is, if it isn't already out there. The mites feed so quickly, so efficiently, it's possible they're dwelling in other sandy areas and just haven't been discovered yet. How many small desert towns have they picked to the bone? How many beachside communities have been decimated? I can't say for sure, but I can say this. Next time you take a trip to the shore and decide to feel the sand between your toes, make sure to look down from time to time, just to make sure your toes are still there. Grasping clawed hands, slimy tentacles, skeletal fists, all reaching out from the dark to claim you. Is this the monster in the closet, the beast under the bed, or the horrors inside a simple item of clothing? It's a sunny Saturday afternoon in the early days of summer. The sky is a bright, cloudless blue. The sun beams down on the crowds of kids home from school and adults hoping to get out and soak up a little bit of the cheerful energy. It isn't just the students enjoying the fact that school is out for summer either. Teachers are on vacation too. One particular teacher is enjoying her first day off in months, taking full advantage of the free time. She starts the day with coffee and breakfast, then stops by a local ice cream shop for a strawberry cone and heads to one of her favorite summer pastimes, a yard sale. She follows the signs to a driveway filled with what she just knows will be hidden gems. They say one person's trash is another person's treasure, and she is the person who considers those cast-offs to be undiscovered treasures. She picks through the cardboard boxes of yellowed books, bags of worn stuffed animals, crooked shelves, and wooden rocking chairs with paint peeling off. After picking up the third shoe in a row that doesn't seem to have a matching partner, she's beginning to think that this particular yard sale might be a bust. But then, she spots it, draped over the back of an overstuffed orange couch. It's a coat made from fine, high-quality wool. She doesn't have much need for a wool coat in the summer, but it looks so nice that she can't help but pick it up to get a better look. The material is heavy and sturdy in her hands, smelling faintly of dust the way all true vintage pieces do. She should know. She found the beautiful 50s blue linen dress she's wearing right now under similar circumstances. She shakes out the coat and holds it up to get a better look. It's even better than she first thought. It's a military great coat, and it looks a great deal older than it did while slung over the couch. She'd guess that it's several hundred years old, easily. It might be the oldest piece she's ever seen at a yard sale like this. Surely the owners of this house aren't just selling this coat, it must be out here by mistake. A coat like this, with its age and likely linked to military history, could be in a museum. She catches the attention of the homeowner, an older woman showing off a chipped tea set, and calls her over. She asks the old woman about the coat, wondering where it came from, how old it is, and most importantly, how much does she want for it? The old woman regards the coat with confusion, insisting that she's never seen it before in her life. It didn't belong to her late husband, her father, her grandfather. She has no idea where it came from. If the younger woman likes it so much, she can just pay $5 for it and call it a day. Thrilled at her good luck, 
the yard sale enthusiast hands the old lady a crumpled $5 bill and takes her prize. On the walk home, she continues examining the coat. No tag, no label, nothing to indicate when it was made or what army might have used it. She doesn't recognize it from any particular era or nation. Between that and the fact that the old lady at the yard sale claimed she had no idea where it came from, the coat seems to be one big mystery. Depending on the angle she looks at it from, it could be from World War I or it could be from the 1600s. She's a history teacher, she should be able to put her finger on it, but she just can't. When she gets home, she rushes upstairs to her full-length mirror, cranks the air conditioning up, she doesn't want to sweat all over an antique after all, and throws the coat on. Maybe taking a look at the silhouette of the garment on a person, in this case, herself, will help her make a better estimate of the coat's origin. She slides an arm into each sleeve and takes a look. Not too bad. Definitely too heavy for summer, but it's beautifully constructed and definitely a genuine historical garment. It's going to make an amazing addition to her collection of vintage clothes, and in the winter, she'll be able to stay warm in it on the walk to work. She's just about to remove the coat when she feels someone tap her on the shoulder. She spins around, gasping in shock. Is someone in the house? But when she looks behind her, there's no one there. She calls out to the empty room. Hello? Of course, no one answers, and she kicks herself for acting like the foolish main character in some scary movie. If there's an intruder in the house, they're not just going to answer her. But she can't hear anything, can't see anywhere an intruder might have hidden after tapping her shoulder. She must be imagining things. There's no one here. She reaches for one of the coat sleeves again, and again there's the feeling of someone tapping her on the shoulder. But this time, it doesn't stop. The tapping becomes a hand resting on her shoulder, then pushing past her shoulder and along her arm. She doesn't know how, it should be impossible, but the hand is inside the coat with her. She stares into the mirror, mouth open in shock, as a pale hand pokes out of the armhole, hovering just over her own hand. It wiggles its fingers, as if giving her a friendly wave. Horrified and unable to figure out what else to do, she yanks the coat off and throws it to the floor. What else do you do when your new vintage coat starts waving at you with its own hands? Looking at the coat lying on the floor in a heap, it's hard to believe that something so unusual happened only a second ago. Or did it? That's impossible, it must have been heat exhaustion or her overactive imagination. Against her better judgment, she picks the coat back up and throws it over her shoulders again. No sooner has she tugged the sleeves over her arms than she feels the presence of something else in the coat with her. This time, two hands emerge from the sleeves, waving at her frantically in the mirror. She makes a move to take the coat off again, but one of the hands gives her a thumbs down, as if begging her not to. Well, what else do you do when the strange, magical coat from the yard sale tries to communicate with you using hands that appeared from nowhere? You listen. She tries to ask the hands questions, remembering the sign language course she took in college, but they don't seem to understand what she's saying. She asks them if they're the ghost of a fallen soldier haunting the coat. She asks if they can tell her anything about where the coat came from, but all they do is wave. Maybe that's because they don't have eyes, they can't see what she's trying to tell them. Eventually, the hands seem to give up, disappearing back into the lining of the jacket. She's about to take it off again, when she feels something slimy slip up her back, emerging from the coat's lining. It wriggles against her spine like a worm before sliding out of the collar and up her cheek. In the mirror, she can see it, though she wishes she couldn't. It's a tentacle, like that of a massive octopus she once saw in an aquarium. It suctions to her cheek, and she can't take it anymore. She needs to get this coat off now. She begins tugging at the sleeves, pulling it off, turning one of the sleeves inside out in the process, and the tentacle takes notice. It wraps itself around her throat, trying to hold her inside of the coat, squeezing tighter and tighter. She thrashes, ripping at the fabric and raking the tentacle with her nails, but it only squeezes tighter and tighter still, cutting off her air supply. Her eyes bulge, her mouth gapes wide, gasping for air as she fights for life. The only way to escape is to get the coat off, but every time she tries, the tentacle only squeezes tighter around her throat. She can feel other hands, some human, some with sharp claws that dig into her skin, some covered in fur, all grabbing hold of her and pulling her back into the coat. The fight between the woman and the coat full of arms pulls her to the floor, where she struggles violently, throwing her body back and forth as she wrestles with the limbs grabbing hold of her. She tries to scream, but can't get enough air into her lungs to make any sound but a pathetic squeak. 
During the struggle, she winds up with the coat stretched over her head, holding onto her by the neck and two arms. She breaks free, and the coat falls on top of her head like a blanket. And then, suddenly, where there was once a woman and dozens of inhuman hands, there is now just a simple wool coat lying on the ground in an unassuming pile of fabric. She's gone, vanished without a trace. Meanwhile, across town, an old woman with a yard sale sign in her yard gets a visit from a van full of strange men claiming to be members of an elite research organization. They lost something very important and tracked it to her simple small town yard sale. She gives them the information of the woman who purchased the missing item, but by the time they reach her home, she's gone. No matter, one less witness to wipe the memory of. They collect the coat, pile into their van, and carry it back to the SCP Foundation site it was swiped from. No one is certain how it left containment, but they're relieved to once again have custody of SCP-262. SCP-262 is a light brown European military-style greatcoat. A cursory examination of its style led researchers to estimate its period of origin to be anywhere from the late 1500s to the early 1900s. Narrowing it down to a smaller window has proven difficult. The jacket has no specific markings, tags, or other designations, causing the research staff to theorize that it was an original sample design intended to be pitched to military officials for approval as a new official uniform. Then, it was either lost or rejected, resulting in it never being put into wider use. The coat is made of wool and is cut to fall below the knee on most individuals who wear it. Attempts at carbon dating the fibers of the coat have been inconclusive, and contrary to the apparent visual style of the coat, places the age of the wool at around 6,200 to 6,400 years old. The wool itself is thousands of years old, while the coat was made more recently. Of course, the uncertain age of the coat is far from its only anomalous property. SCP-262 is able to manifest a number of arms from its dark inner lining. Any subject wearing the coat may open it in order to materialize hands and arms from within. These arms are, at least some of the time, under the control of the wearer. These limbs can vary widely in skin tone, length, and strength. Some of the arms observed since the item came into Foundation custody include a reptilian scaled tentacle, approximately 13 feet in length, four semi-transparent cellulose appendages over 33 feet long, with four fingers, two elbow-like joints, and no apparent wrists, the clawed paw of a large predatory cat resembling a cougar or mountain lion, as well as a wide variety of feet and legs that manifest at random. The space within SCP-262's lining is regarded as non-Euclidean in nature, and the coat itself is considered a link to an extra-dimensional space. During initial testing, Subject 402M was asked to put SCP-262 over his head in order to see what would happen. When he did so, the coat promptly fell to the ground in a heap as 402M vanished beneath it. Several months later, Fingerprint analysis of an object handled by a human arm that appeared from within the coat identified that arm as belonging to Subject 402M. This incident suggests that some, if not all, of the limbs within the coat belong to beings trapped inside the coat's extra-dimensional space. Wearing the coat in an ordinary manner does not result in the subject disappearing into the space within. Subjects wearing SCP-262 as intended, one arm through each sleeve, the coat across the back, you've presumably worn a coat before and know what I'm describing here, find themselves able to manipulate the arms that emanate from within. The amount of control the subject has over these limbs varies. For instance, Test Subject 301F was able to multitask while blindfolded, navigating her environment in such a way that seemed to indicate some degree of awareness of surroundings on the part of SCP-262. The coat seems to maintain this awareness even when the person wearing it cannot see or hear anything around them. Some members of the research team believe that SCP-262 is fully sentient. They arrived at this conclusion after witnessing SCP-262 playing a piano with two or more hands, even though the test subject wearing it had no musical training, defending itself and its subject from multiple attackers, several of the limbs fighting each other or defying the will of the subject. The Foundation first acquired the coat when the administrator relinquished ownership of it in the late 20th century. The administrator, due to his status, is not required to disclose the origins of the coat or what he might have done with it in the past. All he said about the coat upon parting with it was, In the right hands, it could be extremely useful. In the wrong hands, it could be extremely dangerous. 
In my hands, it was becoming extremely dusty and moth-ridden, and taking up far too much space in my closet. Additional research notes were attached to the SCP-262 file. After perusing these notes, I compiled the most interesting findings for further review. I hope you will find them as thought-provoking as I have. During Trial 7, Subject 722M was instructed to put the coat on properly, then turn the right arm sleeve inside out as he removed his arm from the garment. When he did, a chorus of disembodied voices began to cry out in pain. In spite of this, 722M was ordered to continue inverting the sleeve. At this point, several arms emerged from the lining of SCP-262 and attacked the test subject in apparent self-defense. Subject 722M attempted to retract his arm from the coat, but in the process of doing so, he inverted the sleeve further. This pushed the coat too far, and the long, cellulitic arm emerged from the inner lining of the opposite side, reached around, and up through the inverted sleeve, grabbed hold of 722M's hand and gave it a violent yank. The force of this pull was enough to dislocate the subject's shoulder and injure him severely. Once the coat had returned itself to its preferred position, the chorus of voices silenced, and the arms retreated out of sight. Subject 722M was removed from the coat and given medical attention. His current condition is noted as inconsequential. During Case Study 262-42, SCP-262 was placed on a mannequin. First, SCP-262 was placed on an anatomically correct male mannequin, dressed in attire consistent with an average SCP Foundation personnel. After a few minutes passed, one single human arm stretched out of the inner lining of the coat, reaching up to touch the mannequin's face. It poked and prodded the face curiously a few times, then retreated out of sight and did not emerge again. The following day, researchers placed SCP-262 over the head and shoulders of another male mannequin. After a few moments, the coat collapsed to the ground, and the entire test mannequin disappeared. An added research note revealed that a wooden arm, resembling that of the test mannequin, was spotted emerging from SCP-262 on several occasions following the trial. This further confirms the hypothesis that the limbs inside of the coat originate from entities that were somehow trapped inside. During Case Study 262-307, research staff attempted to observe the behavior of SCP-262 when placed on the body of a recently deceased human being. After a Class D personnel was terminated during an experiment with an undisclosed SCP, the body was placed on a chair in a seated position. The coat was then placed on the body. After several moments, a human arm emerged from the lining of SCP-262, reaching toward the corpse's face. It poked at the face a few times before disappearing back into the coat. A few minutes passed, and then the body began to shake violently. A popping and snapping sound could be heard, and the hands, which had been poking out of the sleeves, vanished from view. The body then went still again, and a human hand reached up the back of its neck, coming from the collar, and pulled the head into an upright position. Then, an array of other hands and arms crisscrossed over the chest and abdomen, straightening the body's posture. As the research staff watched, two arms, cellulitic in nature, grabbed the ankles and legs, pulling the body up into a standing position. Even more arms came down each sleeve. The coat's limbs worked as a combined unit to pilot the body, and managed to escape from the observation room and overpower the security stationed outside. SCP-262 continued to pilot the corpse through the Foundation site, attempting to break out. Guided by exceptionally strong limbs, the animated body was able to knock security guards out of the way even seizing a weapon from one of them, resulting in several casualties. Who knows what might have happened if MTF Epsilon-9, the Fire Eaters, hadn't been in the building at the time. It's possible that SCP-262 might have escaped the facility altogether, making its way into the general population. Using their flame accelerators as aggressively as possible, the MTF members managed to corner SCP-262 at the far side of a hallway. With nowhere to turn, SCP-262 resorted to an emergency escape plan. One of the hands from within the coat pulled the garment up and over the head of the corpse it was piloting. SCP-262 collapsed to the ground, the body vanishing beneath it and leaving the mobile task force without a target. At this point, it is unknown whether this escape attempt was driven by the will of SCP-262 itself or some sort of residual consciousness from the body of the deceased Class D personnel used in the experiment. At this point in time, SCP-262 is under review and additional research to see if it could be useful to field agents attempting to contain other SCPs. At this time, agents are not permitted to use SCP-262 without supervision by a staff member with commander-level authority. 
Whenever SCP-262 is not in use, it is to be kept in a climate-controlled room at an undisclosed Foundation site, guarded by at least two Level 2 security personnel at any given time. It is unlikely that SCP-262 will make its way back into the general population anytime soon, unless it finds itself in possession of a wearer willing to help it get there. Still, if you ever happen to be browsing a thrift shop or yard sale and happen upon a vintage military jacket that entices you to try it on, do so with caution. You might find yourself in need of some help, though you won't need anyone to lend a hand. You'll have plenty of those. The D-Class runs through the halls of an empty grocery store with nothing but darkness around him. He turns corner after corner, searching for a door, but there are only endless aisles and stretches of blank walls. Nowhere to go, nowhere to run. Behind him, he can hear a soft, wet, gurgling sound. He turns, eyes wide in horror, and something pulls him down into the floor below, swallowing his screams. The day is drawing to a close, the sun dipping over the horizon as families across the small town wash up after dinner, placing their dirty dishes in the sink and starting to wind down for the evening. For those rare few with office jobs in this town, the workday stopped at 5 p.m., and now there's nothing but rest ahead of them until the day begins fresh again in the morning. But for the employees working the graveyard shift at the local, woefully understaffed grocery store, the day is far from over. There's closing time at 10 p.m., then cleaning, locking up for the night, and eventually, mercifully, clocking out. One of the workers, a young woman, watches the clock through heavy eyes, threatening to close. She shouldn't have picked up this extra shift. Working a double was overly ambitious today, and she can feel exhaustion creeping up on her, threatening to drag her down into an inadvisable on-the-clock slumber. It's almost 8 o'clock, only a few more hours to go. She can make it. Ordinarily, she'd try to make small talk with her co-workers, but several of them called in sick today. It's just her and one cashier, who's been on break for way longer than the allotted 15 minutes. So really, it's just her. She busies herself, shelving jars of peanut butter, watching the seconds tick by. More of the workday, gone. More of her so-called summer vacation, gone. But every hour worked is more money in the bank, more in the travel fund that will take her out of this town and towards something that might actually make her happy. She just has to save up enough, has to face these monotonous days and the same repeating carousel of faces a little bit longer. Then, it'll all be worth it. She tries not to think about the fact that her older co-workers have said the same thing about themselves, the ones who have worked here for 10 years. They all thought they'd be out of here in a year too, but they aren't. They're still bagging groceries for their neighbors and former classmates, watching the seconds tick by on that grimy old clock. As she reaches down for another jar, someone suddenly speaks just behind her. They ask if they can help her find anything. She spins around, startled, the jar slipping from her grasp and landing on the ground with a crash, glass and peanut butter sprayed across the floor. There's no one there. She must be imagining things, she thinks. But when she turns her back, she hears it again. She spins around quicker this time, hoping to catch them in the act. There's something so familiar about that voice. Did another co-worker come in after all? No, it's not one of her co-workers. Suddenly, as she hears the voice speak again, asking if she wants a paper or plastic bag, her stomach drops. She knows now. The voice is her own. That's it. She's officially too exhausted to keep working right now. There aren't any customers in the store, so she's going to head to the break room and try and get her head together. As she starts the walk there, she suddenly realizes that she can't find the door. The door to the break room is there, but where's the exit? The door she comes through every single day before clocking in. The doors that she practically sprints toward when her shifts close out. The ones that lead to freedom and home and the chance to remember herself as a person and not just an endless stretch of meaningless tasks. Somehow, the door is gone. No, that can't be possible. Doors don't just vanish. She's gotten turned around. She's misplaced it. She paces through the store, determined to find the door. But she can't. It truly seems to have vanished. Sweat begins to bead on her forehead, her hands trembling as she retraces her steps over and over again. It isn't an especially big store. She can't be lost. No, it's just her worst nightmare coming true. She can never go home can never clock out. She's going to be at work for all eternity. Her mouth dries up, 
She has trouble swallowing, trouble catching her breath as her breathing becomes shallower, tinged with panic. It's an impossible situation, but she just knows that this is it, that she'll never get to go home again. At the same time, she's never wanted anything more in the world than to get out of here as soon as possible. If she doesn't, she could die in here. And she swore to herself that she would never ever die in this town. As she navigates the aisles, she can hear faint whispering, like people huddled together just out of sight, talking about her in tones just too hushed to make out. A few aisles over, she hears a sudden, piercing scream. Is there someone else trapped in here with her? She follows the sound to aisle three, but when she peers down the aisle, there's no one there. At least, at first, there's no one there, until she looks down at the floor. There, on the yellowing tiles, a pale, translucent hand is poking up from the floor. The tile around it shimmers and ripples like still water disturbed by a pebble. The hand reaches up, further and further, stretching toward her. It wants her to reach out and grasp it, but the thought turns her stomach. That hand can't belong to anything human. So instead, she turns and runs in the opposite direction, stopping when she can hear the blood rushing in her ears and taste metal on the back of her tongue. As the sound of her pulse fades, her heart slowing, she hears another sound that causes it to spike all over again. A long, slow, dragging sound, like someone pulling something heavy across the floor. It thumps, then drags some more. There's a sound with it, too. A wet, strained sound, like a combination of water bubbling up from a drain and someone struggling to breathe. Every fiber of her being is screaming at her to run, to get out of there right now, but she can't move her feet. The sound draws closer and closer and closer until everything suddenly goes black. If there were anyone passing by the grocery store at the moment, they would hear a scream cut short with a wet gurgle. The next morning, the manager finds her body still lying there in the same aisle. The store closes a few weeks later, never to open again. SCP-3182 is a derelict grocery store in the town of Denton, Missouri that hosts a number of anomalous phenomena during the hour between 7.52 and 8.52 p.m. each day. This window of time is referred to as a Dimos event. Dimos events first began occurring following the store's closure, which is attributed to a combination of an economic downturn and the tragic death of a 17-year-old part-time worker. When a Dimos event occurs, all outside sources of visible light are rendered unable to penetrate the store's interior. Individuals inside during the event will insist that all exits and entrances have disappeared, preventing anyone from leaving or entering. It should be noted that video recordings of SCP-3182 during Dimos events show that the doors do not, in fact, go anywhere, indicating that SCP-3182 impacts the perceptions and mental states of those affected by it, rather than the environment itself. Some of these aforementioned anomalous effects include a sudden, overwhelming but inexplicable sense of distress or sadness, a sense of severe resentment toward the town of Denton, Missouri, the sudden recollection of memories belonging to former customers of SCP-3182, a sense of approaching danger, and the urge to do something to prevent or escape it, and an extreme desire to leave the area even though it is impossible to do so. These effects primarily occur in the vicinity of aisle 3 of the store. In addition to the emotional and psychological phenomena, there have also been reports of disembodied moaning and screaming, the appearance of humanoid apparitions, and the sound of something heavy being dragged across the floor. In order to obtain a more in-depth understanding of SCP-3182 and its Dimos events, researcher Dr. Gradian supervised a series of on-site tests. D-Class 132449 was selected for the first test, during which he was placed within the former break room of SCP-3182 and instructed to remain there for the full duration of the Dimos event. He was equipped with a camera and earpiece to allow for two-way communication between him and Dr. Gradian. At first, D-132449's attitude was casual, even cheerful, as he expressed relief at having nothing to do but sit in a chair for an hour. But after 7 minutes and 32 seconds passed, he began to feel quite differently. The D-Class became anxious, stating, I've got to get home soon, before correcting himself to say that he would go back to his cell after the test concluded. 22 minutes and 19 seconds passed, and D-132449 became increasingly uneasy, asking Dr. Gradian if he could hear a strange sound. The noise was not detected on the video feed, 
but D-132449 insisted that he could hear something and traced the sound to the broken microwave on a nearby table. In this close proximity, the video feed picked up the sound, a soft gurgling from within the closed microwave. Dr. Gradian recommended that the D-Class not interact with the microwave and that he return to his seat. The man refused, insisting that he had to know what was going on with the microwave. The gurgling sound grew louder and more intense, and Dr. Gradian insisted more strongly that the D-Class not open the microwave. But the man did not listen. He opened the microwave, and the video feed cut to black. The remains of D-132449 were later located throughout the plumbing system of SCP-3182. An inspection of the break room microwave found a viscous black liquid inside, which was extracted and taken to a nearby foundation site. Analysis of the liquid's makeup concluded that it was genetically identical to several hundred past and current residents of the town of Denton, Missouri. During the next test, D-342089 was instructed to examine aisle 3 during a Dimos event. First, however, he began in the break room. Before beginning the test, Dr. Gradian gave a strong recommendation that the man avoid pursuing the source of any gurgling sounds he might hear. D-342089 asked why, but Dr. Gradian dodged the question, instead asking the D-Class to move toward aisle 3. Halfway there, he paused, spotting the words, get out of here right now, scratched into the wall over the main entrance. The D-Class remarked that this would be impossible given the lack of doors in SCP-3182. He would not respond to any reminders from Dr. Gradian that there were, in fact, doors in the building, particularly the very entrance door he had walked through to get inside. As D-342089 advanced further into the eerie, darkened store, almost at the infamous aisle 3, Dr. Gradian checked in regarding his mental state. Aside from the atmosphere, which he deemed pretty damn spooky, D-342089 did not report any adverse mental effects. Before he could elaborate any further on how he was feeling, however, he quickly discovered that he was not alone in the store. A figure, a female humanoid in shape, stood at the other side of aisle 3. She wore a simple shirt and flared jeans, and if one glanced at her quickly, she might pass for an ordinary girl, but she wasn't. As the D-Class stared at her, he could see her face shifting from ordinary human features to a warped imitation of a face, eyes, nose, and mouth moving out of place and drifting into abnormal configurations. As she raised a hand, he could see that it was a formless, fingerless blob. This was too much for D-342089. The panicked man fumbled around on the shelf next to him, searching for a makeshift weapon. He grabbed a cardboard box and prepared to throw it at the apparition. In response, she shook her head rapidly, warped features frozen in a look of terror. She opened her mouth, and the sound of hundreds of opening cash registers came out. She shook her head even harder, trying to communicate something vital to the D-Class. He refused to listen to the apparition or to Dr. Gradian, who warned him not to do anything rash. But he did do something rash. He threw the box at the entity with all his might, and as it made contact, he could hear a soft gurgling sound just behind him. Then, just as it did before, the video cut out. After the Dimos event concluded, D-342089 was found alive in a dumpster outside SCP-3182. He was, however, missing something. His skin. An investigation of the interior found that the message he had seen written on the wall had completely vanished following the event. During the third test, D-693221 was placed in aisle 3 and directed to remain there for the duration of the entire Dimos event. Like the other D-Class before her, she was equipped with a camera and an earpiece. As the event began, she reported feeling extremely cold. Dr. Gradian suggested that she remain as calm as possible. She refused, insisting that she needed to leave as soon as possible. When she turned to leave, however, the apparition was standing at the other side of the aisle. Again, she repeated, I need to get out of here right now. I need to get out of here right now. In response, the apparition nodded in agreement. Dr. Gradian reminded the D-Class that SCP-3182 would not permit her to leave, and she replied, I need to get out of here right now, or I'll wind up like her. When pressed for further explanation, the terrified D-Class insisted that she didn't understand what she was saying. It was as if the words were being shoved into her mouth, into her mind. She turned to move toward the entrance, 
and a soft gurgling was suddenly heard. Dr. Gradian warned her to stop moving immediately, and she froze in her tracks. Once she had calmed enough to respond to further instructions, she was ordered to turn and look at the apparition, or rather as Dr. Gradian referred to it, the ghost. When she met the ghost's eyes, it was shaking its head fervently, eyes wide with fear. The floor beneath it shifted like liquid, the gurgling sound growing louder and louder until human arms burst through the floor, grabbing the ghost and dragging it down out of sight. The ghost gestured frantically toward the exit doors, screaming until it disappeared beneath the floor. The gurgling stopped, the floor was still, and all was quiet for a moment. Then, D-693221 was in full panic mode once more, repeating over and over again, I need to get out of here right now. She repeated this constantly for the remainder of her video footage, running through SCP-3182 frantically, screaming and searching desperately for an exit. Dr. Gradian attempted to direct her, to calm her in some way, but it was as if she could not hear a word he said. She was lost in the dread, lost in the dark. After the Dimos event was through, D-693221 was found healthy and unharmed, at least physically. There were no more scheduled tests after this, and she was administered amnestic treatment and returned to the prison population with a reduced sentence. While the woman formerly known as D-693221 carried on with her life, the research team reviewed the footage from her test. One researcher analyzed a distinct tattoo visible in one of the spectral arms that reached up from the floor, matching it to that of a man called Colin Mathers. Mathers is the former manager of SCP-3182 and has no reason to be manifesting as a ghostly arm in his abandoned former workplace, given that he is both alive and, as far as anyone can tell, completely ordinary. That is to say, very much not a ghost. Further investigation into the apparition of the girl was conducted, including a series of interviews with past regulars and employees of SCP-3182. Many of those interviewed recounted anomalous activity far before the closing of the store, including an unseen entity that would mimic their voices. This particular detail inspired the research team to conduct one more test. D-442099 was sent into SCP-3182, placed in aisle 3, and instructed to remain there and attempt communication with the entities there via a Foundation-developed EVP detector. It should be noted that the civilian versions of this technology are far less effective. First, D-442099 began with a simple, Hello? The response recorded by the EVP detector was a mixture of male and female voices, at least three, saying, What can I get for you today? Next, he asked, Can you understand what I am saying to you? And the entities responded, That'll be unintelligible. He followed with, Can you tell me what you look like? This seemed to provoke a more emotional response, and the EVP detector picked up around seven mixed human voices, saying, Look at me. This place has ruined me. I should have moved to Jefferson when I had the chance. Where are you now? resulted in over 25 voices saying, One day I'll have enough money. I'll get out of this place. The response to, What is your name? was too garbled to understand as over 70 voices responded at once. Please, I don't understand was met with soft gurgling, which then suddenly cut off. I don't want to die here, seemed to attract the attention of the lone female ghost, as one solitary female voice replied, You need to get out of here, right now. Can I help you? the D-Class asked. The same female voice replied, sounding strained and frightened. Please get out of here, right? Her voice cut off. Hello, the D-Class called out. There was no response. Hello, he asked again. The only response was that same soft gurgling. Then he said one more thing. I don't want to die in this goddamn town. The recorded response was uproarious, cacophonous laughter belonging to a chorus of over 10,000 voices. The sound was nearly deafening. There are undercover Foundation personnel stationed outside of SCP-3182 instructed to prevent any civilians from entering the premises. Civilians who ask follow-up questions are to be given the cover story involving unstable construction. Any past witnesses to a Dimos event must be located and given amnestics dosed in relation to their level of exposure. Because the town of Denton is relatively isolated, any affected individuals should be easy to track down. No Foundation personnel are permitted to enter SCP-3182 during a Dimos event. 
any testing conducted during a Deimos event must be approved by at least one Level 3 personnel. However, if any personnel report hearing a soft, gurgling sound while inside the building, they are ordered to vacate immediately. SCP-3182 is a tragic mystery, an abandoned, decaying piece of a town steeped in misery. Like the town itself, it is filled with fear and uncertainty, with a pervasive sense of hopelessness, of no way out during the darkest moments. I have heard from time to time the expression, dead-end job, and I understand it to apply fairly well in this case. Those working at SCP-3182 while it was open seemed to fill the place with so much misery so much dread and resentment that something anomalous began to take root. Something, for one hour a day, makes those fears real. The people in SCP-3182 believed it to be a dead end, a place where hopes and dreams go to die. And now, it is. A hand clasps around your throat, cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hand of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner, something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything, and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. They age out of trick or treating, and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbors' yards. They age out of the sense of wonder, and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party. And before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment, an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. 
She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door, staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit off. The girl is struck with the feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl, the sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen, but the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself, but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet. But it doesn't say a word, doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. Then, the screams go quiet, nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. The figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watched their even more unfortunate friend encounter the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they too know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. 
However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect, but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen, dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to enter the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt if you just close your eyes. I love you. Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me. Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096 and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19. 
where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation, aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 reports some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29 Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. You're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. But that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semi-o-hazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. 2. An AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again, go better. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, 
or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grab the first thing they could find. Or it could be a faceless horror walking with a relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybell is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Marybell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Marybell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe, and in this weather she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's... No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. 
Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only, the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just the light. Now he's even more confused. 
But try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out. And try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Marybelle was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a… oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. It can't be. It… but it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he? The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. 
Mary Bell is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Mary Bell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Mary Bell whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Mary Bell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe. Mary Bell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Mary Bell at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. 
The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. A face screams in terrible agony. In the darkness, you can't quite make out the shape of its body, but it doesn't look human. It's large and square, almost boxy. Two things you should know. This is a fate worse than death, and it isn't the only one. It's a busy but ordinary day in Hangzhou, China. People are rushing to and from work, going to school, going for walks, buying a hot meal and a cup of tea. But for one young police officer, this is a monumental day. He has been assigned the biggest case of his career, and he grips the stack of files with sweaty, trembling hands as he considers the weight of this moment. It isn't just one case, not really. It's actually six. Six separate missing person cases that he's beginning to suspect might be connected. Our detective wishes he could take a moment and transport himself away from these harrowing missing person cases and clear his head. 
But while he's unable to, we can. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, the hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million players across the world. And they've got some huge news for both new and returning players, the recently added Live Arena. To tell us about it, I've invited a fellow academic to join us today. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get Live Arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. All right, class. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Bob here. What's your personal strategy for Live Arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. That doesn't sound like a very effective strategy. Do not pick me for Live Arena. Seriously, don't. I'm too young to be bone meal. Well, thank you for your- Class dismissed! Do we have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. Class definitely not dismissed, but there's a bunch of brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to the animated limited series Call of the Arbiter, including a free legendary champion, the mighty orc warlord Artak. All you have to do to get him is log into Raid for seven days between now and July 24th. Easy. New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. So just hit my link in the description, and I'll see you on the battlefield. And now, back to the case at hand. The detective was beginning to suspect that the six separate missing person cases might be connected. At first glance, they seem unrelated. The victims have very little in common, except one thing. They all worked at the same office. An office that closed one month ago, a casualty of international corporate downsizing. No one from his police department has bothered to look into this angle, assuming that it will lead back to more dead leads. But the young officer can't shake the feeling that there is important information waiting for him in that abandoned office building. So after finishing up his lunch and dabbing the nervous sweat from his brow with a handkerchief from his pocket, he sets off toward the old office building in hopes of cracking the case wide open. As he makes the trip, he considers some other possible theories. Maybe the missing employees skipped town, overwhelmed and depressed from their unexpected job loss. But would they really let their families worry like this? Some of them have wives, husbands, children, all of whom would notice their absence and assume the worst. No, this isn't a simple case of a group of colleagues all vanishing to blow off steam in another city somewhere. Something bad happened. He can just feel it. Maybe they uncovered corporate secrets and someone decided to silence them before they could blow the whistle. But then again, what sort of secrets would be worth killing for at a printer company? It feels worthless trying to guess, trying to fill in the gaps in his knowledge with wild speculation. The only way to find out was to examine the building for himself and see if he can find any clues at all that lead him to the whereabouts of the missing six. When the young officer reaches the building, he finds the door padlocked shut. Luckily, he prepared for this and brought some industrial strength bolt cutters that snapped the lock into pieces with very little effort. Why lock up the building like this? There can't be anything valuable left inside. To prevent squatters, most likely, he assures himself, brushing off the sense of dread creeping up his spine as he walks inside. As he crosses the threshold of the empty office, the first thing he notices is the smell. It reeks of sulfur and bleach and a whiff of something electrical that stings the inside of his nostrils with each breath. New possibilities turn over in his mind. Perhaps some sort of deadly workplace accident claimed the lives of the missing when they came back in to collect their belongings and clear out the building. Before he can decide if that theory holds any water, his thoughts are interrupted by a piercing scream coming from a nearby room. The officer isn't alone here. There's someone in the building with him, and they sound like they're in trouble. The officer grabs the taser from his holster and runs toward the sound. He skids to a stop, nearly knocking over a water cooler when he reaches the source of the screaming. There's a man hanging from the wall, screaming over and over again. The officer can barely process what he's seeing. The man is covered in machinery, all whirring and clicking as it works. Next to him, a printer is printing sheet after sheet of paper, and all the while, the man screams. 
The officer recognizes the man's face from one of the files. This is one of the missing employees. He can't determine what is causing the man such distress, and he tries to ask the man what happened to him. But the man just continues to scream, eyes wide open and wild, rolling around in their sockets, unfocused and unseeing. The officer grabs the man, attempting to remove him from the wall, but he won't budge. It's as if his body is wired into the wall itself, and the harder the officer tugs, the more it appears as if the man's flesh will begin to tear away. The officer stops, turning his attention to the machinery. Perhaps if he unplugs it, he'll be able to remove the man more easily. He starts with the printer, and as he reaches for its plug, he gets a closer look at the paper it continues to spit out. It doesn't look like any paper he's ever seen, and unable to help himself, he reaches out to touch it. It's warm, soft, pliable, and nauseatingly familiar. It isn't paper at all. It's skin. In that moment, all of the officer's training falls out of his mind, replaced with blind terror. He runs from the building as fast as he can, all the way back to the police station, where he tearfully informs his captain about what he found. This is no longer a police matter, his captain tells him. They need to escalate this to a specialized organization. The young officer is sent home, placed on psychiatric leave, and the next day, the SCP Foundation investigates the building it will come to refer to as SCP-2535. SCP-2535 is a former two-story Hewlett-Packard branch office building in the Zhaoshan district of Hangzhou, China. The building's anomalous nature is characterized by the presence of a detailed network of electrical and biological components of unknown origins. The walls of the building's entire first story are covered with 63,512 USB 2.0 standard A sockets, placed in a grid pattern made up of 20-centimeter semi-regular intervals. Each of these sockets is connected to wires running through the walls, but these are no ordinary wires. They consist of a woven mixture of copper strands and human optic nerve tissue, all wrapped in a layer of keratin. In spite of the inclusion of organic material in their structure, the wires have not shown any signs of decay or deterioration since the Foundation discovered SCP-2535. This curious, off-putting mix of the technological and the biological persists throughout the location and only gets stranger as one moves deeper into the building. If one were to follow the path of these wires, going against their better judgment and the scream of their most primal instincts, they would find that the wires lead to a room on the building's second floor. The room is currently inaccessible, but is thought to have once been the server room. Whatever is blocking the door is large enough that it cannot be budged, and non-intrusive imaging has determined that it is some sort of biological mass. The inside of the former server room, like the wires that lead there, emits heat at a consistent temperature of 47.6 degrees Celsius. Foundation personnel who approach the room have reported a persistent smell of sulfur and ozone coming from inside, as well as the loud sound of a running printer. 317 of the USB socket and power outlets in SCP-2535 are connected to HP brand USB 2.0 compatible devices. Of these devices, 20 have displayed anomalous, potentially ectoentropic functions. But what exactly does that mean? Allow me to elaborate. Just remember, you asked for this. Don't blame me if you aren't able to stomach the details. There are five former employees of the Hewlett-Packard Hangzhou branch still located inside of SCP-2535. These employees are in an anomalous sort of status, requiring no sleep, food, or water in spite of their continued, seemingly endless consciousness. Since the building's discovery in April of 2013, they have not changed in any way, or at least not in any visible way. All attempts to remove these former employees from their, let's call them predicaments, have proven unsuccessful. Allow me to discard any euphemism and explain just what exactly became of these unfortunate workers. First, there is Guo Pingping, the former branch manager. He can be found in the bathroom near the receptionist's desk on the first floor. Goa's head has been forced into the feed tray of a DP DeskJet 1112 printer, which is plugged into the wall. This is troubling for a number of reasons, one of which is that the internal dimensions of this particular desk jet model's feed tray are not large enough to accommodate a human head, and its components are not strong enough to crush a human skull into a shape that would fit. Nonetheless, Goa's head is firmly lodged into the feed tray. One would assume this would have killed him, but his body continues to move, kicking and thrashing about as if he is in pain. The former assistant branch manager, James Gu Yonggun, is located in the employee pantry on the building's second floor. 
His body is attached to the wall in a vertical position, held there via 92 20-inch USB 2.0 M-M cables. Five additional cables have been used to secure the actuating unit of an HP DeskJet 2540 all-in-one printer to Goo's lower jaw. The arm of the actuating unit is also attached to a single HP 10 original ink cartridge in the color black. This ink cartridge is attached into Goo's throat at a continuous rate of one stroke per second and, in defiance of the known properties of ordinary ink cartridges, has yet to run out of ink in the years since its discovery. Goo appears to be partially conscious, but is unable to communicate intelligibly when addressed. The former Human Resources Department head, Angel Lee Hui Min, is still in her former office on the second floor, though she no longer performs the duties of her old position. She is still, in a sense, in Human Resources, or rather, is a Human Resource. I apologize, sometimes I have to make a joke to cope with the dark subject matter at hand, but Angel's fate is no laughing matter. Like Goo, she is attached to the wall via a series of USB cables. There is an additional cable, one of unspecified length, inserted into her lower abdomen, which is slightly distended, as though filled with a foreign object. Though a proper analysis has not yet been conducted, the variety of sounds and motions originating from the area seem to indicate that there is a fully operational HP USB single station thermal receipt printer lodged near her small intestine. As a consequence of this, a never ending stream of thermal receipt paper is pouring from Angel's mouth at all times, causing her considerable pain and distress. Wang Liang, the former head of the IT department, is permanently placed near the water cooler on the first floor. Like the others, he's bound to the wall by several USB cables, 37 to be exact. There are 12 HP ScanJet 200 scanners pressed against his body, all switched on and running at all times. Next to him, an HP DeskJet 1112 printer is attached to the wall and constantly printing out sheets of… something. A closer inspection reveals that it is not paper, but rather, sheets of skin. He is conscious, but no successful interview with Wang has been conducted due to his nearly constant, wordless screams of agony. The fifth human subject found in SCP-2535 is Chen Yupeng, who once worked as a trainee technical writer. Now he spends his days in the branch manager's office on the second floor of the building. His body has been wedged into the paper tray and backup paper tray of an HP LaserJet Pro 500 multifunction printer, which has been plugged into the wall via a standard power cable and a 3 feet USB 2.0 M-M cable. His head sticks out of an aperture, cut into the side of the printer. The printer itself functions normally, printing copies of the HP Standard Print Quality Diagnostic page and the HP LaserJet 500 Technical Repair Manual, alternating between the two. Since SCP-2535's discovery, it has not run out of either paper or ink. Chen himself is unconscious and shows signs of severe blood loss that, under ordinary circumstances, likely would have resulted in death by now. During a preliminary inspection of the building, one Foundation operative discovered a Canon PIXMA E480 printer in the first floor janitor's closet. This printer was dented and heavily corroded, most likely from the application of liquid bleach, and was also covered with human teeth marks. It has spent the most recent several years attempting to print a 91-page document, but has been unsuccessful due to an apparent jam in its paper tray and feed mechanism. The seams of the printer occasionally ooze human blood, which DNA testing has matched to Yan Xiaoxia, former creative consultant of the Hangzhou branch. SCP-2535 must be sealed away from the public, under the guise of health and safety concerns. At least two agents are to be stationed in a nearby building at all times, for the purposes of observation. Wherever possible, the inside of SCP-2535 must be soundproofed. All material generated by the building's anomalies must be collected and disposed of on a daily basis. So far, these containment measures have been sufficient to keep civilians away from SCP-2535, as far as the friends and family of the missing employees know, their loved ones were never found. It's better that they think of them as lost or dead, rather than learn what truly became of them. As I was poring over the file for SCP-2535, something curious caught my attention. This is not the only anomaly catalogued by the SCP Foundation concerning a branch of the Hewlett-Packard Corporation. I considered leaving well enough alone, but I've never been particularly good at that. When another path presents itself to me, no matter how dark or foreboding it may seem, I cannot resist the urge to see where it will lead. In this case, the path led me to SCP-2211. SCP-2211 was a collection of four anomalies discovered in the Shanghai offices of Hewlett Packard. Notice that I said, was, rather than is. More on that later. First, 
allow me to describe the nature of each anomaly. SCP-2211-1 is a 932MB video file titled simply longsmile.wmv. When played, the video depicts a pair of lips on the right edge of the screen. The lips hold a closed mouth smile for a moment, then open to reveal teeth. At this point in the video, the camera pans to the right, revealing more and more teeth, seemingly forever. Though the length of the video file is listed as 55 seconds, testing revealed that the file will continue to play, revealing endless, maddening rows of teeth for more than 150 straight hours. It will possibly run even longer than that, but testing was through before that could be seen. The video has no audio track. When longsmile.wmv is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device used to play it will begin to secrete a small amount of human saliva. A sample of saliva was collected for DNA testing, but the results were inconclusive and did not match any known human being on record. SCP-2211-2 is a 2.0 megabyte audio file entitled EYEE parentheses 79.wav. Each playthrough of the audio file is different, but tends to contain bursts of modulated static that go on for 2 to 10 seconds before being cut off for around 0.3 seconds of silence at a time. Like Longsmile, this file can play for a seemingly infinite amount of time, in spite of its listed length of 3 minutes and 3 seconds. When SCP-2211-2 is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device will begin to secrete a clear fluid, identified as a mixture of water and sodium chloride, amino acids, glutathione, ascorbic acid, and human collagen fibers. Essentially, the device will begin to leak human tears. SCP-2211-3 is a 599 kilobyte file titled r.exe. When this file is run on a computer, it uses up a great deal of memory, causing the device to overheat and its built-in fans to speed up. In spite of the overheating and any damage it might cause, the computer will continue to run until disconnected from its power source. When the file is run for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, air coming through the built-in fans will begin to emit a strong smell of earwax, though no physical traces of earwax have been found. SCP-2211-4 is a USB adapter-powered coffee reheater. When it is plugged into the USB port of a computer, any liquid placed into the container will be heated to approximately 65 degrees Celsius and will also transform into human mucus at a rate of 1 milliliter per minute. This effect is the same whether or not the computer is on. DNA analysis of the mucus revealed that it is a match with the saliva produced by SCP-2211-1. All of this would have been bizarre enough, a series of files and devices that produce human biological material and are seemingly all connected, but something else happened. All instances of SCP-2211 were kept in a pair of containment lockers. However, on June 10, 2014, this containment was breached. I have included a surveillance log transcript that captured the incident. It occurred as follows. Sound of banging metal detected near second floor of Wing B. Door of small item containment locker DAD-2838 is heavily deformed outwards and has experienced a heavy impact from its inside. The sound of banging metal persists for the next three minutes as the door of containment locker DAD-2838 begins to burst outwards. Security teams are deployed to cordon off the area and manage the situation. Containment locker DAD-2838 is fully breached from the inside when a segmented, humanoid arm emerges, extending to reveal numerous joints along its length. Security teams begin opening fire on the arm to little effect. While the video feed shows that the arm terminates in a seven-fingered hand, personnel present on the scene reported a number of fingers ranging from five to approximately thirty. The arm repeatedly strikes and breaches the containment locker containing SCP-2211-4, approximately five meters from containment locker DAD-2838. It subsequently reaches for SCP-2211-4 and pulls it back into containment locker DAD-2838. No further activity detected arm presumed to have dematerialized. Following this incident, the containment locker was examined, but no traces of the many-fingered arm were found inside. Further examination of the locker's contents revealed that SCP-2211-1, 2, and 3 had vanished from their storage media. The files were gone. SCP-2211-4, when tested, no longer displayed any anomalous properties. It was just an ordinary coffee heater, though no staff wanted to use it to heat their coffee no matter how many times it was washed. Head researcher Min declared SCP-2211 uncontained 
on August 10, 2014. But there was one more unusual finding. The USB drive that once contained SCP-2211-1 was not empty. There was an untitled text file on the drive. When opened, it simply read, Got my my nose, followed by an unusual text emoticon, colon colon o o, end parentheses, end parentheses. As a man of science, one who has devoted my life to exploring the unexplained and seeking answers to questions that most are afraid to even ask, nothing troubles me quite like a mystery left unsolved. But the tales of these Chinese Hewlett-Packard offices are composed almost entirely of disturbing mysteries, of frayed wires and broken printers, of survivors that cannot tell their stories, and messages we will never get to read. What happened after that Hangzhou branch closed? Was it connected to the findings at the Shanghai branch? Did that mysterious arm grab hold of the Hangzhou team, contorting their bodies into unrecognizable shapes and forcing them to meld with the products they once sold? Or was it once an employee too, broken down into spare parts and trapped as files and desktop beverage warmers? I can't be certain. But I do know this. I'm throwing out my printer. I think I'll just write my notes by hand from now on. I won't necessarily suggest you do the same, but do be careful while handling the machinery. Treat it with respect. After all, you never know if that printer was once as human as you or me. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2128, The Liar's Cradle, 